rappers. Because rappers are blue pill, beta males. I think we all know that by now. Blue pill, beta males.
Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Some of y'all in peace out to the rest of you. Uh, black heart, black mind, black end. Hit the share button because the message is more important than the messenger. And uh, I want to ask y'all to hit that share button because that's what's, um, that's also going to help you guys out. And here's why. When I say hit the share button, gentlemen, it doesn't only mean that you actually press the share button and send a link to someone. If you find that you're a very good speaker and you're articulate, feel free to just go ahead and tell uh, by word of mouth what it is that I'm saying to somebody else. If you know somebody that can benefit, but they would listen to the message more coming from you than they would coming from me, someone they don't know, then that's how you share it. <clears throat> if you think that I explain it better than you would be able to put it into a nutshell for them or they need to hear it directly from me, then you hit the share button literally and send them the link. You do whichever one you know is going to work best for that person. Because again, uh, the goal here is for people to benefit. And this is the motivation behind uh, me saying what I've said. My anonymity is not only to protect my job and livelihood and my ability to travel and take care of my children uh, and visit my parents and my brother. It's not only that. It is also so that I can keep a clear intention so that fame uh, cannot be a motive. Because understand when you were anonymous and you're trying to do something good, um, that prevents the motive of fame from creeping in subconsciously. And um, I'd like to be beneficial, but the minute I put my name or face out there, then you have to question my, my uh, sincerity in my motives. Why would I do that? Even when people say, cam up, cam up, yeah. Okay, let's say I did that, and then um, I start moving around after having shown my face and put my name out. Um, what's gonna wind up happening is that even if somebody says cam up, I may lose my livelihood, but as I move around, there are also chances, especially when I go back to the States to visit, that people are going to come along and say, hey, how you, yeah, what's going on, Black? I saw your channel, man. And, and that can go to your head. And I'm not looking for that. Because um, this is what happens oftentimes with a lot of commercial entertainers. When they're underground, they're local, then they go regional and that's fine. Then they sign a big contract and then they got to play Hollywood, even if they don't want to. So that being said, let me go ahead and get started on this. I don't plan on being short or long in this case, just to be honest. I don't plan on uh, being ex uh, uh, expressing either one. I think my time will probably be in the middle, but I don't plan on opening up the panel yet, but I'm flexible. We'll see what the schedule's like. Uh, first thing I'm going to start on is, um, oh, I see Black Uru was in. All right, uh, it's morning where I am to answer the question. Um, I'm listening. Uh, it's, 10, it's about to be 10.30 a.m. here. Uh, all right, so, uh, yep, good morning, Mr. Hyde. I'm listening. Uh, uh I think, I'm, I hope I'm pronouncing it right. And Black Uru and Red Lion. Okay, so we an NC worker, what's going on? So we have a mentor in here, Black Uru Strikes. I appreciate you staying up this late um, to listen to this. And when I say you, I mean plural you. One of the sad things about English is that there's not really a way to say plural you and the, only, the closest to it is y'all, which is not considered a formal English word, where it's in just about every other language. There's a singular you and a plural you. There's a formal you and an informal you. and uh, so there are times, oftentimes when I, I start using English, that's one thing I find limiting and I have to stop and think about that at times. Uh, I have to specify, do I mean singular you or do I mean you all, plural you? And I find myself writing this to my parents sometimes saying plural you when I uh, write a message to them. I say, well, I want to thank plural you for raising me and my brother, right? Oh, sorry about that. I want to thank you both. So that, that's a... Uh, yeah, that's one of the limits to the English language. So anyway, let me get right to this. Um, first thing I want to talk about is going to be Sister Ali. And uh, I want to say that, that uh, on one hand, most of us are very appreciative of the work that she's done. And when I said that she was like the uh, paternal grandmother of the manosphere, um, 
I wasn't the first one to say that. I think MTR was the first to say it, but uh, I also had a similar idea because it's just like my own mother is the paternal grandmother to my son. Now, I did not plan any of my three kids. So I made the same mistake three times. I am especially foolish. And so I had to learn uh, a fool's lesson the hard way. And I've stated this before. And this is how I know that um, I, this is how I know how difficult it's going to be, gentlemen, to find someone who's actually going to go along with family planning the way that it's supposed to be done. Um, they just don't do it. I mean, the whole idea of family planning is something that it's not been we men that shot down. It's been something that ladies have shot down. All the forms of birth control are for them. And we still have a lot of unplanned children in the West in general, not even just in our community, but in the West. Chile and Greece also have it. Um, Scandinavia's got it. And so you're starting to think, okay, well, we don't plan it, so that it must mean they plan it. Because they, they, they dislike family planning. It doesn't matter who you marry or who you lay down with. Every single uh, lady is going to have an allergic reaction to, let's say, a birth control pill or some sort of birth control that's very effective. The more, con the more convenient that birth control option is for you as a man, the more they're going to have an allergic reaction to it, even if it's only a 1% allergic reaction that it would get in studies and these things have to go through rigorous studies and you're going to find that all of them say oh, i have some sort of reaction to this or that or the other um because at the end it only comes down to one thing in the west and that is that they simply don't want you to have a, a sexually fulfilling life that's when you're romantically involved with them that's when you marry them it doesn't really matter they just don't want you to have a, a, a fulfilling sex life. End of story. That's what they don't want for you, especially if you are a normal man. And notice, I didn't say mediocre of neck beard living in your parents' basement. I'm not talking about any of that negatively stereotypical stuff. I'm talking about you being a normal man. They don't want you to have that because they've been uh, subconsciously and consciously indoctrinated with a hatred um, or, or contempt at the very least for normal men. And unfortunately, Shahrazad Ali showed that if she is not a victim of very, very, very bad information, that she has this way of thinking. It's one of those two. And I would suspect that it may be a combination of both. So as for those who lied to her, I can't blame her for someone else lying to her. Neither, none of us can. We don't want to. But you see, this manosphere is something that she, in, she indirectly helped to conceive. She did not necessarily conceive or come up with it the way that the men who started and pioneered it did. But she became an ideological source for the men that started it because she was talking about this three decades ago and some change. I remember that. I remember when that book first became famous. Now, I think it took months to take off in terms of fame, but I remember when it became famous. I was in middle school. I was just coming into black awareness and here, she, here was her book and everybody was talking about it. Don't forget, some of you saw in Living Color, the comedy um, series from the Wayans Brothers. That's how Jim Carrey got his start. And she was roasted or spoofed, you could say, even in that one. Oswald Bates is a fictitious character. Look him up. O-S-W-A-L-D, Bates, B-A-T-E-S. Some of you are old enough to remember the character Oswald Bates. He was spoofed. Uh, well, he was a spoof. And so um, when you saw that three decades and some change ago, it cracked us up because that was actually kind of foretelling that the, the conscious community was going to become uh, exactly what Oswald Bates was depicting. And, and that's exactly what wound up happening. And so, uh, oh, wait a minute, hold on. To prove my point, thank you, Quaj. In the form of lotion you rub on your shoulders every morning, and the feminist protested and petitioned its development. So uh, do you mean to say they petitioned against its development? And see, that's funny there. I imagine it probably would have had some side effects over the long term, but notice that Quaj did not mention the side effects, and I think it's because it wasn't even uh, uh, mentioned in their protest. It was simply the fact and this is what I want you gentlemen to understand. You cannot be trapped. 
Um, I mean, you can, of course. But when you cannot be trapped, that's when they protest in the form of boycotting you. That's what that's about. I remember um, as I was getting ready to go to um, Black Africa for the first time, and that was South Africa. It was the first and last time I went to Black Africa. I do plan on returning just a different part. As a matter of fact, right now, I'm looking at my mouse pad, and my mouse pad um, is, is a South African mouse pad. It's got photos of different places, and it says land of contrast. And yeah, I got a mouse pad from South Africa. When I was getting ready to go, um, at that time, I still lived in the teacher's residence building. And while I was interested in my current wife and we were talking, uh, we were talking about trying to schedule what we were looking for in each other and when to meet her family. But we were doing so without other teachers knowing because we weren't doing anything wrong and doing anything we weren't supposed to do. But people gossip. The last thing I and I was I was hypersensitive about being a source of embarrassment for women, because, as you all know, I had learned at a young age that I was a source of embarrassment for black women especially attractive ones. And it wasn't because I was ugly. So I was still operating on that. This was about 20, yeah, the end of 2017. And I got on the bus one morning and there was a, a South African teacher with whom I still work. He's of Indian origin from Johannesburg. I always thought he was from Durban for some reason, but that's beside the point. Now, he's an older fellow and he's got a, a sharp sense of humor. And he's got some wisdom. He's got a lot of experience working here in the Middle East. And he said, if you're going to go there, uh, who are you going with? And I told him, well, I'm going with a, a British teacher that works for the same company, but he's in another city in this same country. He's down the highway, actually. Um, he's going and. Uh, um, then the South African teacher said to me, well, look, Black, um, you, you want to stay, if you're not going to fornicate, then you better stay around someone else because they're going to come after you, meaning the women are going to come after me. And uh, I said, well, uh, okay, it's okay if they come after me, that's fine. Um, but I had to pretend to be somewhat interested because I didn't want to leave any hints that I was already in discussions with the lady with whom we worked. The point I'm making is that when I said to the man, suppose I tell him that I can't even have any more kids, then what? I can't afford them. But I didn't phrase it that way with him. I simply said to him, suppose I tell him that I can't have any more. He said, oh, well, then they'll leave you alone because, see, they can't trap you. And it just came out just like that. This man's not Eidos. He's not even black as far as we know. He suspects having black ancestry, but he has no proof of that. Uh, so I, I want you to understand, and, and this is South Africa we're talking about. I want you guys to understand what's going on, Sir Anthony, the, the, what, what this means. What this means is that what is convenient for you represents a problem to them. And they don't have to be from the states. Now, what does this have to do with Shahrazad Ali? Because she's obviously not that much of an enemy to us. Okay, fine. My mother did not conceive my son. I did. Not intentionally, but I did. My mother conceived who conceived my son. Shahrazad Ali informed the men who later on turned and informed us as a whole uh, in this space that we now call the Black Manosphere. Before there was anything like a, 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 before there was even a Matrix movie, before that, she was actually one of the first ones to drop red pill knowledge in the form of a book. I say one of, some would say it was Iceberg Slim even before her. Whatever the case was, she was one of the, the first ones to do so. She was certainly the first lady to put the game out uh, like this as far as I know. If there was another lady that did that, most of us don't know who she is. So uh, I think there was a lady in the 70s, a Caucasian lady that did so, uh, a German Argentine lady, if I'm not mistaken, that put out some book like that. Um, but 
uh, she did say something about how, how all of the women of the world were actually in on a major conspiracy. So that was a confession and she had her life threatened as she lived in different places. She had to move because of the death threat she got. Most of us don't know about it though. Shahrazad Ali, most of us know about in this space. So in terms of the black manosphere, she is in fact like a grandparent. She did not have anything directly to do with the conception of the black manosphere, but she did have something to do with the ideological understanding and conception of the men that turned around and uh, conceived this manosphere space, even if we argue as to which man it is or which men they are, even if we debate about that. The information that they brought is going to trace back to her book. And that's what I mean when I say this. So you see, you may choose the other parent of your own child. You do not choose the other parent of your grandchild. And that's why this is not even allegorical to me. It's not metaphorical or symbolic. It is literally the way that I describe it in my mind, just not genetically, because this is not about DNA. Actually, this is about a genetic war. That's where it has to do with DNA. But let me move on. There's one standard that, that, that um, they have in the West for us that she can't break away from. She has talked and told sisters about how they got to stop judging men, how they got to stop assessing black men by certain shallow standards. And she's been right, we can't really afford that. Uh, but there's one that she cannot break away from herself. And she showed us that. And that is other women's approval of an individual man. Even she could not break away from that. The first thing she went to when asked about the manosphere, even though she said some, it was the first thing she mentioned. And that was that men sounded like they'd either been rejected by a woman or turned out by a man. And I said before, if, if you turned out by a man, I mean, you were, like, you were turned down, you actually liked it for whatever reason, then you're going to be in a completely different space in terms of social media and psychologically. That's where you're going to be. You're not gonna be here in a manosphere, white or black. You're not gonna be amongst us. You're gonna be amongst the ones who are also into men and, and addressing their concerns. Or you're gonna be silent and live that life that way, whichever way, that's going to be the space in which you are. You're actually going to be alongside Charizard talking about, oh, you just you just mad because you into men and you don't want to admit it. But what she said, that slip up of hers, it implies one that the average adult male is stupid enough to be that affected by one woman's rejection. It also was the reason I said that we can no longer respect Western women's standards as even being reasonable. We have to leave them to their standards, that's true. We're not gonna force them to change their standards, but we have no business respecting or validating them. We have every right and even obligation to take on the attitude, whether we express it or not, that it is their choice, it is a bad choice, but it is their choice and they're going to sit in the consequence for it. They choose, they have all the options when it comes to birth control and the fact is they don't have to do anything to get the ding -a which is our fault as I've said before. This is, uh, this is our fault. I admit that the only thing that we need to take accountability for, as I've said, is that we have made the draws and other things by extension too easy for them in exchange for them making these things too difficult for us. And they don't like it when I tell you this, if they hear me say this, they don't like that because what that means is the only thing you need to change is that, that you need to start putting up the same walls to climb that they put up for you. Because most of you in this audience are not the ones uh, for whom they make all of the exceptions. You're the ones to whom they hold to the rules. I am one of those that they hold to the rules in general in America. By extension, I already know in Canada, I don't have to go to Canada and try. The culture is the same. I know that that's what would happen if I were there. It would actually be worse there because I can't tolerate that kind of weather. I would get sick. And so therefore, it would be even more difficult for me. 
Same thing for the UK, similar culture, colder climate. So it would, it would probably be even worse over there. I leave, I leave the West in general, two non eight oh sisters spoil the hell out of me. And so I in turn try to spoil the hell out of them. Completely different dynamics. There's one thing both of them had in common too. Neither of them wanted to live in the U.S. One is a U.S. citizen, spent part of her childhood there, decided she didn't want it and left and won't go back willingly. The other one had never been to the U.S. and didn't want to go except maybe to visit. But actually did not want to go. Said to me, if we can register the marriage with no paperwork from, the, uh, from your embassy, that's better. Didn't want the U.S. government to know she even existed, even as the wife of one of their citizens. That's another thing that, that, uh, I, that I noticed that they had in common. And of course, they were both practicing Muslims. So I've seen this myself. You deal with these Western standards and it's, it's always their standards, their preferences that become standards that get them in trouble. And so therefore, uh, it's not about saving her. You can't, but you must also understand that even your tone needs to be either you don't say anything at all or your tone needs to be be word you made this bed you lay in it because you used your you weaponized your womb to reproduce with the worst men that you could find and even then they oftentimes weren't bad enough for you because you see the studies have already shown that we are the most involved dads, even when we're not with the mom. So what that means is that the men they're choosing so that they can keep the kids away from these men later and join the single mother's club still try to be involved with these kids. Even the dope boy. Will still try to be involved with the kids if she lets him go. That's what that means. That's what that's what the study implies. So we have to sit up and look at them and say, you may have weaponized your womb. And if anything, the, your only failure, according to your own mission, your only failure was not ruining the community even more than what has been ruined. You've still ruined it, though. You're just upset you didn't ruin it even more. Because you didn't count on men or at least on black men having a patriarchal, a, 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 even a paternal instinct, an instinct to bond with their own kids. One more thing about her and, and her standards. Every woman in the world is going to assess a man's attractiveness um, by something beyond his control because they have preferences. And that's not necessarily wrong. Within reason, you, we should expect that because within reason that may happen with us too. We have a preference. We don't blame, uh, uh, we don't necessarily blame a woman uh, because she's not our type. We just like our type. And some of that is going to be what is not within their control. Some of you like them uh, short and petite, what you call, well, what other people might call fun size. Some of you may like them medium height, medium weight. I'm not going to address the ones that like them uh, obese or tall because that's that's very, very, very rare. And you've got to move away from that. But uh, uh, it, 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 what I'm getting at is that within reason, you don't blame a woman as not your particular type or your preference. You might even still give her a chance. But there are some things you have a preference for that are not within their control. And you are man enough and grown enough to not blame the women that don't have these things, even if you don't incline towards them. That's natural. That's normal for both genders, regardless of culture. But. Any Western woman that doesn't understand what the issue is in the West will also fall into assessing a man's manhood and masculinity, not just how much she likes him, but how much of a man he actually is in her eyes based on something beyond his control. And this is unacceptable, even if Shahrazad Ali does it. So using other women's determination or other women's opinions or even really just confessions, not always opinions, but using other women's confessions as to how attractive a man is, is judging his manhood and masculinity by something beyond his control. And this is something we'd have to call her out on. 
Now, the last point, period, I've got about uh, Shahrazad Ali for now is that she herself isn't ready to admit that a man's success with Western women is usually a sign of something wrong, not something right. That's the end of it. About her, I mean. If she knows that the Western black woman is so further mucking damaged in terms of how she views the men and will raise the kids, then you can't sit up and, and use the same standard, uh, her, which is her approval of some individual man, as a sign that that man's opinions actually mean something. If she's only going to listen to the opinion, the opinions of men like Minister Jap, who tend to, let's say, they score with the sisters in their specific area. Then that means she's saying that they're actually normal. And we already know that the Western black woman, by her confession, we learned this from her is not normal, even according to uh, other black women that are not from the West. My ex-wife in Morocco didn't know much, but she understood that the Western black woman was not normal. She understood that. She got it. My current understands that they're not normal. She gets it. I don't think she understands exactly how, how abnormal they are or to what degree, but she gets that they're not normal. My current wife told me that when she was in college in the States, one of the things that disgusted her was when she realized that most of the uh, women in her college, and she didn't specify ethnicity. She just said most of the women in her college had more than one boyfriend and each one serving different purposes. That's what she told me. And she said that was disgusting because the way she came up, that was it was just disgusting as hell. So, um, I'm gonna put Sir Anthony's comment up. She would have to listen more and speak less. And that's the other thing. She listened to someone tell her about the manosphere instead of listening to men in the manosphere. And see, the way we're trained, men and women alike, is that it makes it hard to listen to certain people. It is hard for some people in the manosphere to listen to Game Changer because of his voice. Maybe one or two people outside of the manosphere, but those who argue with the manosphere have said the same thing about the Reverend Brother Pastor Deacon Dr. Edward Allen Anderson. Shout out to both of them. Because of his voice. Taz went in and used the voice to try to uh, say that he wasn't even um, hetero. Or a man, and he wouldn't, uh, he wouldn't survive on the cell block. He tried that stuff. And that brings me to my next point. Um, Shahrazad listened to someone else tell her, and I still hold her accountable for that because if she had said, well, this is what I've been told so far, but I'm still listening to get a better sense of it. Then I wouldn't be recording this about her. I would still cover the other topic I'm going to, but I would not have included her in this recording. I'd have no reason to do so. I would have to fuck the shuck up about that because she said, OK, I'm still listening and learning more. But this is what someone told me about it. Oh, OK, well, that's what they told you. And you're still willing to do your own investigation. Nothing more needs to be said except thanks for listening. You'll find out more. That's not what happened. And she did say it seems, just to be fair, she did say it seems um, however, that was the first thing she said. She even said some, but this was the first thing that she said. And, and the fact that she said it seems and she said some is the reason why I'm not just sitting up here cussing her smooth the uck fout. Now, I think that Edward said to her a few FUs, if I'm not mistaken, if I understood it correctly. I'm not going to go that far uh, because 
for one, she did show some inclination to understand that her first impression may not be right. It's like she's just now meeting her ideological grandchild from the very beginning and doesn't even fully understand how much it's her grandchild. That's one thing. Secondly, uh, uh, what's going on, Race and Cortez? How you guys doing? Secondly, this is the other reason right here that I put on the screen. Thank you, Black Guru, for putting this up there. If she wrote this three decades ago and all she got was pushback and, and fighting about it, and anything except, you know what, you're right, we've been screwing up, we've been acting like we're the ones with the testes and driving the men away and then we're mad at them for not being there. And, you know, we just, we can never be satisfied and it's us and it's not them, which would have been the right thing to say. Um, if she had, if, if sisters had said that, I don't think that there'd be a black manosphere today, but the reason why there is one today is not only because of her pulling the wool and pulling the blanket off of what they were covering up and pretty much saying this is like a conspiracy that, that almost all sisters are involved in. But it is also because after she did it, sisters wouldn't admit it even then. And they just kept on putting it back on us. To prove my point, this is what I want to say to her. She called it correctly three decades and some change ago. They fought her. They fought her when she talked about eating healthier. They fought her about all of these things. Now, mind you, I'm going to tell you all something right quick. One reason I do understand that she is so devoted to making sure that the black family can survive is because her husband made the ultimate sacrifice, her second husband, Yahya. He passed away in 2000 something from uh, cancer and he didn't even tell them about the diagnosis. He didn't tell her or the, or the grandchildren. And actually she adopted nine kids, three she birthed, the other nine she adopted. So she's doing the stepmothering. I'll, I'll, I'll at least say that where it comes down to what she says black men should be willing uh, to do like stepfather kids to a certain extent, she did not say that sisters should only bring uh, uh, kids in, to a good man. She didn't say that they should only do that, which we know sisters are doing. But the fact is that she actually walked the walk more so than she talked that talk in that regard to give her credit. Y'all know me. I'm all about being fair. If I disagree with you, but you did say something correct and I can see it or you did something correct, I got to call it. And she did adopt nine that were not from her womb. She did do that. She was out in the front. Her husband was not. I don't know exactly what his job was, but he was in this case, he would have been the one supporting her. And then he made the ultimate sacrifice. He passed away. And he died slowly and painfully because of the cancer. Shahrazad Ali's parents both died when she was uh, young and they died of the same thing at different times, heart attacks. She thought that people died quickly, painlessly like that until her husband Yahya passed away from cancer and she saw him die slowly and painfully. But the thing was that he lived with he lived with and loved and supported the lady that was telling the father mucking black world, really, especially the Anglophone black world, that the sister girl was out of line, driving a man away, not the reverse. And I'm sure he caught flack for being with her and loving her, which is a good reason for him to stay in the private eye. See, we we just instinctively knew she must be married, but we didn't ask who married her, who was the husband. A lot of us don't even know that he's uh, uh, deceased because we don't even understand how old she is. And that's because she has done what she said. She has eaten healthily throughout her life. She had one benign tumor at some point. That's what Shah Razad Ali has dealt with. I'm not saying this to put a business out there as I like to blame her. I'm actually trying to give her credit where it's due. When you get to uh, an advanced age like this to where you have a great grandchild, that can remember you, old enough to remember you, 
and all you had is a benign tumor, you've obviously been blessed, but you've obviously also done some things to take care of your health so that you don't push away that blessing from God. Because we already know if God blesses you with something and you abuse the blessing, he either takes it away from you or he lets you abuse it more so he can punish you more if he doesn't really love you. We understand that as, as a spiritual people that are sometimes too spiritual. That's one principle we can understand. And it's true. We've seen it happen. So she's obviously not abusing her health and taking it for granted. And therefore, she has had one. And many of us don't know this for a good reason. We don't look at her and see how old she is. Which is a good thing. And here's another thing I want to point out in her favor. How many gray hairs does Shahrazad Ali have? We don't have the slightest clue because she's never been in on she's never been in front of a camera with her hair showing. Think about how on a subconscious level that has influenced us to respect her. That means we have an instinct to respect that kind of modesty. And we didn't have to think about it. We just we can see it and don't have to have a long, drawn out conversation where we say, OK, I'm going to respect her and I'm not going to respect her and I'm going to respect her and I'm not going to respect her. We just know this. If we have a conversation, it's short because we're all on the same page. We don't know how many gray hair she has because we don't know anything about her hair and it's not our business. And and she has not bragged about that. She has just simply gone up in front of cameras where you can see who she is. You can identify that's Mrs. Ali. And she starts talking. But even with all of that wisdom and modesty, there was the chink in the arm. I shouldn't even say chink, sorry, because I'm not here to insult people even accidentally, but there was the gap in the arm. And that's why I'm going to go with what Black Uru says. I'm not here to bash it, but this is something we must remember. So that in the event that any of you ever are, uh, are in a position to talk to her like MTR was, you can say, wait a minute, hold up. Now, see, that part's not true. Now, when you were sitting down with MTR, Mrs. Ali, you said it seems that some, not all, have these issues. What have you learned since then? Exactly, the blind spot. And how do you get rid of a blind spot? You either re-aim the mirror or you turn your head and look directly at it. But that's how you, you eliminate a blind spot when you're driving. And there is a chance that she has sat and listened to more. Maybe this message will help her. Maybe someone can share it with her. Even if you don't hit the share button, maybe you can sit and tell her. This is not what it's about. It's the fact that you wrote this stuff a long time ago. You were correct. Sisters fought you about this. And now today what we're dealing with is the fact that we men have actually improved. And that's assuming that the statistics from decades ago were even true. We have improved to the point that the statistics that have been taken recently have shown this. 2015 is when we learned that we were not the deadbeat dads we were stereotyped to be. And that reminds me, speaking of false stereotypes about black men, if you want to see um, two mainstream movies that counteract that, one of them is Without Remorse. Michael B. Jordan and uh, Lauren London are in that movie. I don't know if that's where they met or not, but they were in that movie. And I might need to do a review of them. Um, the other one is uh, Black Box. And uh, another lady that we respect, Felicia Rashad, is in that movie. And uh, I forgot the name of the main male actor. I can't remember his name. But uh, Black Box is about, it's actually very interesting because it's about uh, memory, amnesia, and memory, and identity. It's about all of this. And it's about fatherhood and family. In a movie that has suspense and all this other stuff and it has enough action in it, it's got all that good stuff. And I'm sure a lot of you have seen Black Box and Without Remorse. I might need to do uh, a review of those. Matter of fact, maybe I'll do that later today, my time, which will be in the afternoon, you all's time. Uh, if I'm going to do it. But 
um, the, the statistics have shown this. And I don't think either of these movements will be as relevant as they are to us, meaning black people in or outside of the manosphere. If these statistics had not come out and shown that, that the stereotypes were a further mucking lie and we believe them, understand this, one of the gaps in our armor as black people, men or women, is that we believe the stereotypes, starting with the Tarzan movies. Those Tarzan movies were so further mucking powerful, even to us, that today you're looking at a bunch of youngsters who never saw one old Tarzan movie in their life, and they still believe that they're supposed to act like the savages in those movies that they never saw, chasing after the one white guy that can live in a jungle and talk to animals. That's how powerful they are. Kevin Samuels was right about that, and so was Dr. Omar Johnson, as much as those two ain't going to agree. They were both right about the power of image, even after the image has not been shown anymore. Because think about it. How many of us saw D.W. Griffin's Birth of a Nation? We saw Nate Parker's, but how many of us saw D.W. Griffin's Birth of a Nation? That was out before anybody in this room was born. But who of us saw that? We still know every negative stereotype about ourselves that we know a bunch of our people who believe them and therefore bring them to truth and life. Incarnate and manifest these negative stereotypes because they believe that's who we are. Based on a movie, the first full length feature film in the United States, not necessarily the world. There was one longer in Australia, but I forgot the name of it. Forget about it. But in the States, the first full length feature film had imagery so negative that even generations that were born and didn't see it still believe it. So I'm done with Charles Ali for now. Since I've mentioned uh, the assessment of manhood, uh, Mr. Samuels, that's the perfect segue into the next thing I'm going to say. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and put the link to the panel in here because it turns out we might actually have time for some of you all to come on when I'm done with this. And I'm going to say this, and this is regarding false dichotomous thinking um, or these, these false dichotomies that we tend to believe. Unfortunately, we black folks fall for this all the time. Uh, we, we, we are presented with uh, either or, which one you drop on it. You can only, uh, we see this on Facebook and uh, Twitter. You see pictures of different artists. You can only get one ticket. Or we see pictures of different heroes. You can only talk to one. And even in, these, even in our hypotheticals, we always talk about making a tough choice. And then in real life, we're primed to accept dichotomies that don't have to exist. And I'm gonna tell you what I mean in this case, because why am I talking about Kevin Samuels and, and dichotomies? It's simple. Some of you may have seen that there's a little bit of talk now about whether Kwame Brown is the best one to represent black male interest or Kevin Samuels. It's a new debate. Kwame Brown and Kevin Samuels themselves are not debating about this. I'm just saying that you may have seen some people start to, to talk about this on social media. Which one? Which one's better? I saw it this morning on Facebook, my time, I mean, a few hours ago. We accept either or when it's not necessary. Sisters have gotten us on that. That's why, as I've said before, you really can't, most of you, most of us are not lucky enough to be able to be young and have all the stamina a woman wants and also have the old man money that a woman wants at the same time. Usually we got to go through the stages. We have less when we're young, but we got more stamina. We have more resources when we're older, but we have less stamina. That's just the way that is. That's an actual natural tough choice that God has given to women in us. They turn around. The, the, the Edo sister, which she got from Miss Anne, of course, they turn around. And they present us with these false dichotomies. Well, you want me to look this good or you want me to know how to behave. I can't do both. Who said you can't do both? Women around the world have known they've had to do both to be able to keep the man. And they've done it for generations. And now all of a sudden, in recent history, Boom Shika Bon Quish and Sapphire sat up and said, I can't look good and behave myself. I just can't do it. I can't even look decent and behave myself. I just can't do it. For me to know how to behave, I've got to be 250 pounds, 5'5" four kids by eight baby daddies. Then I might know how to behave, and even then I'm probably going to have an attitude. That's what we've been dealing with all this time. False dichotomies. 
So right now, there's going to be a debate about whether Kwame Brown or Kevin Samuels is the better voice in face of our community. Let me help you with that. This is going to be a really good time to hit the feather muck and share button if you have not done so already. Thank you for those who have hit the like button. Uh, it's been 43 of you when we got, uh, uh, let's see, got 50 of you listening. So I appreciate those of you that have hit the like button. But as I said, the share button is even more important. So if you ain't done so, go ahead and hit that now because I'm, uh, uh, I'm about to really settle this one right quick. The first thing about this debate, before it, gets, before it becomes mainstream, before the debate becomes mainstream, the way that Kwame Brown roasting his roasters has become mainstream, the way that Kevin Samuels has been roasting uh, the Boom Sheikas and Bon Quishas and Entitled Sapphire has become mainstream, before this debate really takes off, hopefully it never will, let me go ahead and settle that right now. The first thing is that Kwame Brown and Kevin Samuels are not at each other's throats. They've given each other shouts out. Neither one of them is competing for some sort of leadership position on behalf of the Western black man. So we're not going to fuel this stuff. That's a beef they don't have. And we know debates today become beefs tomorrow. And if it's going to be a legitimate and necessary debate, then fine, because the beefs at least resulted from that. But before this unnecessary one takes off, and it results in unnecessary beefs. You hear me addressing this. They're not in this debate. So let's not give them that. Because the world has such a high population anyway. The world has such a high population anyway that it, that men must be different from each other. We must have different skill sets, which Kwame Brown has, has actually said before. I think he said this to Judge Joe Brown. Men have to be different because it takes all it takes different skill sets to make a world. Notice, I didn't say that it takes the stupid people to. I didn't say, nor did he, that it takes the idness. They got to be included. I didn't say that. I just said that there can different skill sets and even different facets of society in different spaces are going to have to be present. There will be diversity. And even that has its limits. I already said that this is false dichotomous thinking, falsely dichotomous thinking that we have. And they're not even in on this, but, they, but they're not in this debate. This is not their debate. This is ours. But there's another thing, too. There are two extremes that our community does not need to represent uh, our men. And when I say our community, if you think I'm talking about the community with all uh, you know, flat blackness and including the women and the children, and if you think I'm talking about that, they don't need this any more than we just just we black men in the manosphere need to be represented by these two extremes. They're two extremes no community needs to represent anyone in the community. One is this androgynous, trans, non-man, non-woman, both but neither. Uh, ridiculous stereotype, you get the idea. That's not some extreme that we need. But unfortunately, Mr. Samuels is associated with that because of mannerisms he picked up from being raised by a single mom, and he has said this. He's pointed this out himself. So this is not, uh, this is not actually who he is. When I said we don't need that to represent the community, I wasn't even taking a shot at him. But I'm going to address the fact that many people, especially his enemies, are going to associate him with that right off the bat, point blank period, because what they're looking for is the other extreme. And we don't need that opposite extreme either. That's the hyper macho ninja, the idness, IDNS, or their champions and advocates, like a particular YouTuber who calls himself a goat. He calls himself exclusive. He just got roasted, I think, by uh, Ramil, if I'm not mistaken. Um, he just got roasted by a few people. And he was created. Oh, he also got roasted by the Grinch, too. He was created by the matriarchy. That is very true. But he, let's just take him as a former Idness, now a champion and an advocate for the Idness. And we don't need that mess. We don't even need to be represented by people who are doubtful in having left behind that idness lifestyle. Even they're not supposed to be trusted to, to represent us. They got to spend time not only proving to us that they're former idness and not idness anymore, 
More importantly, they need to spend time adjusting to being a former, but no longer an idness. They need to spend time reacculturating and getting rid of some of these um, dysfunctional ninja principles by which they lived previously, such as the no snitching rule. I mean, granted, you could use that in a revolutionary fashion if you're actually engaged in a revolution against your enemies, but that's not what we're dealing with here. So they need to get rid of some of these ideas that they may still carry with them. Like uh, if you read a lot, then uh, you're too bookish. They need to get rid of even that. The ideal man is well-rounded. He can fix some things. He can maintain some other things. He can prevent, optimally, he can prevent certain things from even breaking to the point they need repair. And he can also learn information in both spoken and written forms. Ideally speaking, men are well-rounded. If he's a master of no skill, he at least becomes a jack of many skills, ideally. A master of, let's say, one or two and a jack of maybe three others. This is the ideal. And the ideal is not on either extreme. And everyone's not going to be ideal. That's not a realistic expectation to have. And I get that. So these two extremes are what we don't need. And Kwame is not one extreme. Neither is Mr. Samuels. Neither Mr. Brown or, nor Samuels is on either of these extremes, even though some people will associate them with these extremes because we are surface thinkers and we're even worse explainers in our first language. We don't even want to learn enough of a vocabulary when we're in our teens to be able to explain intricacies and nuances and things of that nature. And this is what it is that I wanted to go ahead and point out. It's taken me 57 minutes and uh, 50 seconds to do so. Um, so one person decided to come up on the panel so far, man of tomorrow, MOT. How's it going, sir? And good evening. Hey, what's going on, man? I, I, I think that those two people, they're, they're, they're fighting an individualistic battle, both kinds of ways within the space where they're actually fighting it. We know what KS is actually uh, fighting. He's fighting the actual fact that this person deserves something of high value, let me put out this caricature and draw these women in off to a flame. And why don't they explain? Because it's because he knows the sociopathic nature of what he's inviting up for them to explain in their own words why they're worth something that they can not culturally afford versus in this in this musty. I, I get it. I don't watch it, but I'm not trying to talk like but but the Kwame Brown thing. His thing is for all the celebrity type of things that he go after. And people feel attached to that because they feel like they don't have a voice. And like most of the, both of these people are given a voice to people who've never had a voice before, who actually been locked out of uh, the media, period. It, it, it's it's kind of like when you look at TV and you look at Lester Holt, and the way that he actually talks, you would think like there's no way in the hell a black man like that could actually represent my interest in the actual media. And then they have other media and other people who represent things that they actually see on a daily basis. And those are the two people that they have. So there's like three or four other pieces of that missing. But you have to understand when you've never had a voice before and you have somebody that kind of collapses on the point of view that you actually have. That's what you're actually going to end up with at the end of the day. And these are the first of many, because these are the people who are online. Like, there's probably people in cities who have this type of point of view, people in barbershops who have this point of view. Like, none of those people are on YouTube yet. Like, there's a lot of celebrities who have this point of view, who lost their career fields and all this kind of stuff a long time ago. They got way better name recognition and everything else than all these people. So what I'm saying is that it's going to start off like this but it's going to end up being old celebs that are actually taking over this kind of space going forward because people out there in your everyday life do feel this way they got a hell of a lot more rain, name recognition than either one of these dudes across the united states and that's what's going to happen because we haven't had a voice at all your voice is always connected to sales and 
movies and not really having a controversial point of view. And then you have these guys who can go out here and just pretty much slay people because these other people are paper tigers on paper. They're pretty much paper tigers. And, and it's like, you know, they're paper tigers. I know they're paper tigers. I know these people can't go live. And on public, they know that most of these people can't go toe to toe with these people because we know how weak these arguments are overall. And the arguments are kind of assigned to us. We're not able to actually interact with the TV. Now you get to interact with the TV now. And that's just kind of where we're at. And so now if more people can come out and say what they directly observed Correct. without the approval of others and it's changed everything. Yes. Um, and and it's going to keep growing because, like I said, the celebrities are, who who fallen off, who people actually like, who got millions of people who actually know them, they haven't even came to the space yet. Those are going to be the people who actually come and run stuff, especially when it comes to entertainment. These are just the first people doing it. I mean, like, could you? Because could I just watch? Um, a live stream, and I'm like, man, this dude could be so much bigger. He got name recognition across the world. He's just not promoting it right. And I'm like, man, if this dude ever get this stuff figured out, this dude's going to be a problem. And, and it's like, they don't understand that when you create a power vacuum where somebody is getting taken advantage of and somebody don't have a voice, when those people actually get a voice, you better look out, man. Better look out because the problems we're talking about today, and I made this point earlier on my live stream, kids don't have to wait for their actual parents' recommendation to stay away from this stuff. The environment has already taken that up on itself. It's general knowledge now. So now you don't have to worry about the ignorance of your parents not teaching you a lesson. The consequences of that much so within the environment, it really doesn't matter what's being taught at home. They're going to be in a better position versus somebody in my 40s, versus somebody in their upper 30s, versus somebody who are in 15, 16 years old. Okay, be this because on one hand, we can circumvent the parents, but on the other hand, we can circumvent the parents. So it sounds yeah. like what you're saying is that th this is a double-edged sword. It could hurt them like a, uh, like a very sharp knife, but on the other hand, it could also be like a surgical scalpel that uh, allows them to pick off the tags and the warts before they grow under the skin. And um, if I understand you correctly, because you're much smarter than I am, I, I've, uh, let's just say I've seen your IQ test. Um, it was off the charts compared to mine. But did I understand what you mean correctly? Yeah. Okay, all right. And this is part of why it is that I, I say hit the share button. Um, we do have to be, what this means is that what we're wielding with these channels that we have, we're wielding a very sharp blade. And we have to make sure that we're using that blade to perform surgery on injuries and not using these sharp points and sharp blades to just cut and, and um, just cut and eviscerate and wound people that need the treatment. Uh, now, of course, if we're doing this to the ones that don't need the treatment, that's fine. I usually don't go in on them so much and, and go on debates with such people because one, they have the mainstream media um, backing them up. So they don't even have to come to YouTube except as consumers. Um, and then number, and, and the exceptions, of course, maybe Cynthia G and uh, Black Women's Fear. Um, but even then, um, I tend to aim the blade as a scalpel because if you can get to the young cats, um, they can get to those even younger than them. And Correct. then that can turn around and just put a, 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 a wall in front of those like uh, synthetic weave and uh, black women's fear so that when they start talking that stuff, they just, they hit, they hit the wall, whether or not they've already hit the wall, meaning they hit one wall, regardless of the biological wall or, or regardless of how far or close or how, how much behind them that wall is. Um, and so we, if we have what you said, if we have that power, then we're going to have to be very careful about how we wield it. And, Correct. Um, so that means that, that you and I, especially you with your subscriber count, uh, 
and those like you would have to be really careful about who we endorse as well. When somebody else comes up and decides, okay, well, they're going to create content. We're going to have to be very careful about which ones we endorse, uh, to whom we're going to direct some traffic to, because um, I actually didn't think about how powerful this was until you just now told me. I mean, if I had sat and thought about it, I would have come to the conclusion. I just, it just didn't cross my mind that much until you just now mentioned it. And this means that, that we're the ones holding these, um, these double-edged swords and they're very sharp uh, or these scalpels. And we're going to have to be very, very conscientious about it uh, because it's like the tree that you're planting right now. You may get some shade when you're old, but it's going to shade a hell of a lot more people when we're gone. And so we got Correct. to think about what it is that we're planting and what kind of shade it is that we're building for them um, and, and who can hide under it. So um, with, uh, with regards to this, this Kevin uh, Samuels and Kwame Brown debate that, that not those two are having, but that others are having about which one they're going to get behind, uh, what would you say to, to the men that even sit up here and discuss this as though this dichotomy is, is a necessity? Um, it, it's, it's not. And that's what I'm going to bring up like tomorrow night about how it's kind of devolved into just responding to the biggest voice in the room rather than having your own individuality from where you are at. Like okay. the black community, ha well, <laughs> black people in general have this kind of a uh, problem with trying to get by trying to build a cult of personality versus actual tangibles and results. Like these two people are good representations for, for what they actually present. But you need a whole spectrum of this in order to work. Like other communities, they, they're not waiting for these people to represent them because they already have solved this problem. Like tonight, or I guess last night, I went over the actual idea of how the Shahrazad you know, issue isn't what's there. She was she was there to cover up another issue for her own benefit. She went to the wrong people with the right solution. She was supposed to take that to the women to get them to understand the men. She wasn't supposed to come to the men to get the men to understand the women. And it's like you're going to need a facet of a, a shade of this across the whole spectrum if you want it to change. And this is how kind of the. Um, reasonable woman market has actually exploded but the reasonable woman market that has actually exploded is not going after the problematic women inside of this society like Shahrazad Ali is not sending shots at the two people that you brought up earlier that's where the fight needs to be taken to if she's a person who are looking for a very specific result you can't be talking to us about what you did in 1989 december 1st when you released that book we want to know whether or not it was successful how come you did no updates to your book look at the results we have are you fighting an effective fight right now rather than riding off old glory and the war changes over time and a lot of people don't want to get or understand that the war has changed so they want to fight the old war the old way, but it's like the actual terrain has changed and you can't really fight that war like you used to fight it in the, you know, the early 80s, I'm sorry, the late 80s and the early 90s. You know, we now have, we're now 30 years past that. So there, there are new tools that's going to be able to take this fight upon us because black men weren't even allowed to be on TV like that when she first even had the book come out. You know, Arsenio Hall had his show and he really couldn't go that far as in to go into actual black issue. You know, he was on TV to do the entertainment thing still. So now these people can just go wild out and they can destroy those actual paper tigers that are actually in media itself. Now people are seeing the actual power that people have when it comes to the individual without a voice here. But it still takes a spectrum of it. And it's good that those people are not really needing somebody to get on one side or another. It's just that you have to understand that it's going to take a wide spectrum 
of people on the ground and actual tangibles and results that this connects to in order for this to work. Okay, so now you said that she should have taken this fight to the two that I mentioned beforehand. Mm -hmm. You know, or taking the book. You're not referring to uh, Mr. Samuels and Brown, are you? No, 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 no. Okay. I'm, I'm talking to the to, to the women. Like, she could have yeah. sold more books in the time that she went on MTR stream if she was prepped to even bring those women's name up, not even attack her. It's like, we don't need to be going in such and such sister's direction as boom, 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 boom. We don't need these types. Of, she didn't even have to um, address their content or anything. It's just that in that moment in time when you're having that conversation, you got to be prepared to let your prospective market know which direction that you're going. Because if the direction that you're going is what you was on in 1989, that's a missed opportunity. She really didn't even have to go. Dude, it, it could have been must-see TV if she would ever go on the show to meet these people and talk to them and called him out by name later on and explained herself. She could have reestablished herself in a way that I thought that she could have, but the way that she established herself on that show was resting on laurels. I'm like, we ain't on resting on laurels plays here. There's a lot of fight that need to be done. You, you, you have a brand of being a person who's reasonable, willing to forgive the past, but you got to fight the fight right now. And it was a missed opportunity because they went after the wrong people. And she brought up the wrong type of criticism to kind of shut down arguments. And that's bad. You, you, you can't tell people that they hurt. You can't tell people that they, you know, suspect the LGBT. Listen, there are real consequences out here for dealing with uncultured women within black America. Real consequences, real people real pain that they're going through right now there's no way you can just dismiss it out of hand because you want to get an upper hand in the conversation that's normally how no conversations have been kneecapped in the past but see you, you got to have somebody who's on the ground to let you know what the landscape is so that way you don't come out and miss these opportunities to do the bare minimum of making yourself look great. And that's kind of the PR move that she didn't do by going on that dude's channel and thinking that that guy is a leader within the manosphere itself because of numbers. Because that's another thing. It's not the actual platform that you go on that has the numbers. It's the conversation that you have, the meaningfulness and the effectiveness of it. How is it received by people? All these things kind of come into play, and I wish somebody should have came to her and be like, look, you're not going to look good to a certain group of people, people who are actually got a voice right now. Like, she, her, her name could have been in the mouth of all people in the space. If she just went in that direction, said those types of names, because then they would have responded, blah, blah, blah. They would have looked crazy trying to defend those bodies and track records. No way they would be able to do that. She could have lightly just went in that direction. Like, I see some people online like, bam, bam, and bam. These people are a bad look. Like, Lizzo, bad look. No way you should be representing black women publicly. But back in the day, her being cool with all those people and paying me in lip service is how she got her position. But lip service can do the actual other thing too and her status that she got and she just missed a huge opportunity now she has to you know uh backtrack and i mean i don't think she's gonna backtrack because there's too many people who want to believe this stuff but that's just where we're at right now okay uh if she had gone on to that space um, she, let's say she'd gone into his interview and she made the points, we would have had her name in our mouth. And that's true. Even I would have uh, in a yes. different way, of course. But more importantly, her points would have been on our tongues. Um, I can see where it was that 
I can see what it was that the chief made the error to. Um, and that is in how she presented the answer, even though she said it appears that some, instead of simply saying uh, they're rejected by women or turned out by men, she did say it seems that some, which leaves some hope for her to, to um, figure out what she missed the first time. But she did. I understand why she came to the men um, 30 years ago. Before that, she wrote a book about eating healthy and cooking healthy, which I think was addressed to the women. And yeah. she said that the women were the ones that either, they largely didn't say anything and a few of them came in her with attitude, but mostly men supported her. And that, that was why she then wrote a book for the men to understand the women. Um, it was in response to her trying to reach out to the women before and meeting with the answers, meeting the response and the lack of response that she met. It was, it was largely silence and a bit of negativity from the sisters. I get why when she explained that, and that was years ago, she explained it. I get why she then turned around and wrote, wrote uh, the black man's guide to understanding the black woman. And I understand also why she wrote um, the black woman's guide to understanding the black man. And I noticed she didn't catch any flack for it. So that means to me, what that means is she didn't uh, uh, offend them as much. Uh, I mean, she didn't offend the men. And so therefore, uh, I mean, if she had offended the men in that book, then sisters would have come out and said, mm -hmm, girl, that's right. And they didn't. She still didn't get support from the sisters for me that she just simply hadn't uh, uh, offended the men as much enough for them to come around and say, OK, she's finally seen the light. I came to, to understand that she just didn't. Um, uh, she didn't offend the, the men, even when she wrote something for the women. And so Correct. by that point, they just it's like by that point they said well we've already gotten on her case because she told on us and snitched us out um and so now she's not snitching us out but she's trying to tell us how to understand him and what he's been through and what he's been how hard he's been working trying to make us happy we'll just ignore this because we've already dissed her it seemed to me that that was the response um and it, I did it, really, yeah, it yeah. was it, it was and, and and here's another thing about that it's like once you cross that type of line, it's impossible to get those women respect again. They were okay with her having the man understand them. They were not okay with the women trying to understand the men. That they were not okay with that. That they wasn't. They only wanted praise one side. They didn't want to be criticized. Like, if you bring any of them onto a panel and if you just get them to actually understand the environment, it's like pulling teeth, right? Like mm -hmm. they know how bad the environment is overall. They know the level of treachery that has happened at the expense of men overall. They can't come to fathom the results of what we see right now. If you bring a woman onto a town panel, it doesn't matter. I, I can, I, like my silent aunts, come out with straight forward say it. Boomer aunts, they can't even come to admit it. And that's what most of these women have come to the point to where they have this sense of um, sense of entitlement that they can't possibly think because they haven't arrived that there's a problem. And when you open up the door the wrong way, which is what she did, is by having the man understand the woman it was the improper thing to do at the time, given the money hand report that came out of 65, given the actual results that happened with no man in the house in the early 70s, that gave birth to the actual children in the early 80s, given the actual um, okay. documentary that came out, I think it was 80s, 80s, 80, 86, about the crisis in America, the black family, when they had all those single women on there talking about how they didn't need, they, they didn't need a man, you know, the uh, Bill Moyer special. Then you have her book that comes out three years after that. Then you have the gangster rap and the, the R&B in the 90s that tried to loop men back in into, you know, loving people who really didn't respect them at all. And then you had, you know, the... After, you know, it, a, a mess. There was no era where women was actually put 
to any type of scrutiny for how they treated men in society. It was a blank check. The blank check was, we're going to just give you tons of options of men, and we're not going to hold you to any type of account. Because they was promised a stepdaddy at the end of the day. That's what this whole thing was about. We're just going to feed you more compliant men that didn't solve the non-compliant woman problem. Well, that imbalance is, uh, that's exactly what I've been uh, trying to address the whole time in this channel. And this is why I have said that we men actually, we black men in the West, and really black men worldwide, globally, because they blame black men globally, Western, Eastern, Southern, but they don't care. They blame black men for being conquered and not building it. And what you just said is exactly why I've said we men must we black men must uh, shun responsibility, especially in public. And the only responsibility, yeah. accountability we should ever take in front of them is for making things too easy, both sexually and non sexually. We've just been too easy. Right. And uh, what you said about their attitude towards um, needing to understand the man versus the attitude towards being understood tells us everything. Because, see, they were actually upset with her. We have to understand. They'll say, well, I need a man that understands me. But in reality, they hold it against you if you understand them or if you don't. If you don't understand them, they hold that against you. But they don't really want to be understood either because they wouldn't be something that you could, with your logical mind, understand. They've, they've not done that even in outside of the West. Now, they've been compliant outside the West. But in terms of being understandable, even outside the West, even traditionally speaking, that's not something that they've done historically. Um, and the reason I say it is that because living here in an ancient culture, they have certain proverbs about women themselves and about the confusion um, that they have in trying to understand these ladies. And what they say is, as an example, uh, if I make a promise to someone um, and the man doubts me, you know how we poke our lips and look at somebody with a side eye, poke our lips out, look yeah. at someone with a side eye to say, I don't believe you. And what they do is they suck their teeth the same way we suck our teeth when we think something's BS. They do. They got the same thing here. A lot of the body language is very similar to ours. They'll suck their teeth. And they'll say, is that a man's promise or a woman's promise? Now, they're not, they're not asking, are you a woman? What they're saying is, are you promising this the way a man will? Or are you promising this the way that a woman will? Because what they themselves say here is that you can't expect women to keep their word if they don't want to. You can't even expect them to remember the promise they made, let alone keep it if it's what they don't want to do, which I've seen in real life. Um, and, Correct. Uh, and this is why two people should have been interviewing her. In this space, the only two people that I would trust to interview her, that they would have touched on those things, it would have been BGS Edmore or uh, Art New Style TV. Those are the only two dudes that are old enough, that know this stuff inside and out, that could have asked her the questions that needed to be asked, or even guided her in the direction of making statements that she probably wouldn't endorse, but it would look good coming out of her mouth. And it was a missed opportunity by the by the venue that she chose because that person, you know, I'm not even getting that. But it's like opportunities like this when things are this bad, a PR win for the men who actually have done it right is what was the point of order of the day. Not her spitting the stuff she normally spits. We know what she thinks. But it was to let the men know that do she could have sold another hundred thousand books because she would have said it she would have been on the breakfast club the next day it would have came out of Kwame Brown's mouth it would have came out of Kevin Samuel's mouth it would have went through the whole black social media construct that's okay, what I'm saying yes. it, yeah the power of words it doesn't even matter if you don't have the access to complete it it's signaling one way or another that matters everything at this particular point in time because the men didn't do anything wrong. The actual men were the one who were forced to be loyal to the concept of the black family, while the other counterpart portion of it were in constant violation of it. So the men had to pick up the slack and be more loyal to the concept of the family dynamic over the women who never had any intentions on being part of the actual dynamic itself. Okay. So this would, yeah, that would have been a win um, for her personally and financially, as well as a win for us. Um, 
it is true that this combination would have not only, as far as I'm concerned, it would have been the morally right combination. Um, and it would have worked out for her too, on a personal level and on a financial level. Now I understand um, that she's probably, I mean, she doesn't have to get out there and labor for her living now. So I don't think- No, she don't. Okay, so I don't think she's poor, broken, indigent. Um, but by the same token, she could have at least had something to put aside for uh, for later on when she can't travel at all. And, and that day is going to have to come because um, no matter how much you look after your health, you're going to reach that point where you can't travel. If you live long enough, you're going to go through a childlike state before you pass away. Um, sure. And, and so she could have, yeah, she could have renewed uh, the effort that she had already put forward. It's sort of like when you plant a tree, as I mentioned before, you can plant one and in a few years you might get some shade. But then in, in, in another generation, it can shade a house. But you could plant that, that tree one time and it may go through several growth spurts from that one time that you planted it. And this could have been a second growth spurt for that seed that she planted a long time ago. Um, and there's a sudden growth spurt where it just it expands even more in a very short time. That could have been the case. Um, that, that little shot of fertilizer. And um, that's part of why I think that she actually believes if she knows about the space and how it's already growing, then she must actually believe what she said. I don't think she said it the same reason that synthetic weed or that women's fear would have said something like that. Um, because they don't even say it appears that some, um, they wouldn't have even said it that way. They would have said, listen, they're just a bunch of, before he finished the question, before any interviewer would have finished the, that question, what do you think about the manosphere? They would have um, said, well, listen, they're all just a bunch of, uh, they're GAY and uh, they can't get any, and they're, they're mad because they can't get any, which is why they're GAY. And that's not the way that that even works. They would have gone through all of this and they, they would have said, well, you can't, um, they're, they're mad because they can't protect a woman. If you're out with them, somebody's gonna pick a fight and they're gonna duck behind you and this sort of thing. Every negative stereotype about the wimp, about Urkel, they would have thrown on us. Um, no, I mean, but so they I, just wanted you to go back to the drawing board and compete harder. Like that's that's the kind of circular kind of reasoning that 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 goes on. Is that any type of legit criticism turns into you didn't compete hard enough, and it really wasn't the women who was carrying that torch all that much. Men yeah. were carrying that torch for the women for so long that they would just have a conversation so long that a man would jump in and throw that into the actual fray to shield her from actual criticism. It's the men that did that. The actual weak men that she actually didn't want either, who actually wasn't being able to actually get access to her either, but she actually knew that this society and culture has created on a cyclical level because everybody wanted to make it look like they got more than they actually got rather than being respected more than they actually have been respected over time. Because it was about picking up those type of arguments because the look of sexual compromise is actually better than the actual act of being sexually compromised. That's type of a subculture that we've created to protect the woman's choice in society. That's, that is what was created through the disrespect over time. Can you hear that? Can I hear what? Okay. Could anybody else hear a particular sound effect? I'll play it once more. I'll see if, if anybody can hear it. I heard some clapping. That's what I heard. Okay. That's good. Because that's what I was playing in response to what you okay. just said. I wouldn't sure if it, it went through because I'm still learning how to put the sounds and things like this in here. Um, and uh, uh, and it would volumes it's audible to you guys. So I'm still learning it. But uh, not only that, there's another one that uh, uh, there's another one that's relevant to this, to what you just said. This is what it sounds like to the people that have been carrying that torch, that torch and trying to always put it back on black men. Okay, could you hear that? Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. If you can hear it, then everybody else was able to hear it. And that's what it sounds like to them. That's what it would have sounded like to them if she had actually said, well, uh, it, even if she just didn't know, and she said, uh, 
I don't know yet because I just now learned about it and I want to be fair and hear more before I uh, pass a judgment. Then at least that neutrality um, would have caused people to come and say, OK, here, we're going to help you do the research. At least it would have resulted in that. But if she had actually done the research or if he had said to her beforehand, I'm going to ask you this question in case you haven't done the research, I'll give you time to look it up and see. And then you can and then you'll have an answer for the question. Then she would have had the, the, the wisdom and the sincerity because she generally has been sincere from what we can see. Uh, then this would have been wound up being not only a win for us, but it would have also wound up being a win for her, which by definition would have been a slap in the face to the opposition. The same ones that, that were coming up and standing or let's say the granddaughters of the ones that were standing up when she was giving talks in the 90s traveling standing up and trying to tell her off and cuss her out and call her all kind of uh, all kind of names back then. Uh, and so um, the funny thing is, she said black men, sometimes when she gets hysterical, you're going to have to pop her in the mouth, not to hurt her, but just to shock her. She said this. And the funny yeah, thing uh, is, yeah, that was in the book. That was in the book. Yep. That was in the book. And she talked about it vocally. I remember reading it and then hearing her say it on uh, on some talk show later. My whole mother had issues with that. Um, but I remember her saying that the funny thing was that in the decades since then, we have not heard of a rash of men, of, of us just going around um, slapping in the mouth the women we love just because we got into an argument. We've heard of the, of the pattern existing about as much afterwards as we heard about it beforehand. And of course, um, they like to say that we're abusive, but that stereotype was there before. The stereotype did not get any worse, even with, with any sort of uh, uh, substantiation after she said that. That's the thing. When was the last high profile case that we heard of a black man uh, uh, popping the, his wife or girlfriend in a, in a domestic argument? The last high profile case we heard of that. Not Will Bow Wow, because he had a, uh, Will, okay, he said he hit her with a rolled up newspaper on the Correct. butt. Yeah. Okay. Now he, he said he did that. Um, but in terms of uh, an act, in terms of an actual violent slap, just because they're having an argument, the last time we heard about that, I remember it was 1989. This, that summer of 1989, when Christopher Williams apparently went to jail for a little while for, I think, uh, hitting his girlfriend during some kind of argument. And it, it, he might have actually done it. He may not have. I don't really know. But that was the summer before uh, her book became popular and famous. I think she'd written it in 89, but I started to hear about it in 1990. Um, and so she, so I mean, it was, and it was not the summer, the summer of 1989, nobody knew who she was or very few people knew who she was. She certainly wasn't on BET. She was not talked about on BET, summer of 1989. I remember that. And yeah, because her book came out December 1st. Okay, December 1st of 89? Yes, December 1st. And it kind of came to fruition kind of like uh, January, early 90s when the book t t really took off. Okay. All right. So she wrote it in 89. She was probably writing it at the time this happened. But no, no, no. It was released. No, it was released on December 1st. First right. copy, first That's press was released on December 1st, yes. That's what I mean. She would have been in the process of writing it at the time that Christopher Williams got arrested. Oh, sure. And that case was and what was, was being talked about. But of course, we would not have heard because she would not have probably would not have been finished at that time anyway, or she was, she was looking for publishers. So what you said uh, corroborates what I was getting at. The timeline would not have allowed for us to have, uh, have even known about this, much less taken her advice and run with it. Um, it, it would, that would not have even been possible. If we were going to say, well, she said this, and then you remember that famous Christopher Williams case that everybody's forgotten about since then, we would, the timeline would not have supported that. So I mean, the last time that we actually heard about the, not not a, a hints or maybe a false accusation like a little Bow Wow's ex, but the last time we even believed that that might be the case, I remember was was him. And that was months before her book was published. So there was months before anybody could have possibly read it except for her and some editors. Uh, and so therefore, we, what I'm getting at is that if we were such brutes and what she was saying was damaging, we would have taken that and run with it. And there would have been a lot more of us locked up and having criminal uh, uh, felonies today uh, on our records all the way up until now and having to pay fines and things like that. And well, actually, there was very two, 
two very public cases. That's the Chris Brown and Rihanna photos. You had the Ray Rice video in the elevator. You kind of had like the Solange video with like Jay Z. So mm-hmm. there's been a whole lot of high profile caught on tape things that has, you know, happened, but it, it wasn't a, a legislative push to kind of criminalize black men. It, it wasn't. But it, it's just that when it did happen, there was major news when it did happen. It was major news at those times. And funny thing is with Solange, she was the one wailing on Mm -hmm. Uh, Jay-Z. And and Chris Brown, I mean, he was wailing on Rihanna. She said, though, that she had also hit him before. Um, Correct. And like that woman did did actually spit spit on um, Ray Rice before that actually happened to her, too, that she admitted later on that it wasn't just what, that wasn't what happened. There was a lot more that happened before the elevator thing actually happened. But, you know, people only cared about the elevator and her being knocked out and been dragged. Yeah, so, yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and the thing was, look at the time in between any two of these. Oh, years. Exactly. So this means that we weren't out here taking what she said and using that. It's not something that we were doing. Um, because in each of these cases, we either saw or we had confessions of these sisters um, doing something to provoke violence, even if it wasn't justified. They would admit that they at least provoked it or tried to if it wasn't caught on tape already. And so and the funny thing was that it was the pride that sisters had. To say that they did something, to say that they were difficult for these men, they had pride in saying something like this, culturally speaking there was a type of acceptance that they got from this from other sisters. There was a, a verbal or a psychological high five. They got, uh-huh, that's right, girl, you give him hell because they've been encouraged to do this. That has actually um, shown and proven that even when we are advised to, to resorts to slaps in the mouth, generally speaking, we wouldn't even be that abusive if you call it abuse. So, I'm, so the point I'm making is that, that even if people tried to come along and say, well, see, she said this and then black men became even worse. They, they wouldn't be able to do it. And, and I realize now that other women actually know this about us. They know that we, if, for the physical strength that we're reputed to have uh, uh, over other men, that we are actually known for not being abusive and, and not striking women. People understand that we have a taboo against hitting women. And the funny thing is, this is not the, we're not the only ones that have this taboo and are therefore uh, uh, seen as, as being a better option. I'll give another example. Ethiopians and Somalians don't usually get along with each other. Oftentimes, I mean, they're neighbors and there's a part of Ethiopia where they speak Somali and they say it should be a part of Somali, but they they don't usually get along with each other. Uh, Unless, of course, you have an Ethiopian Muslim, they can get along with a Somali, even though their cultures and languages are different. That that's generally uh, that's an exception. But for the most part, Ethiopians and Somalians, uh, uh, they ain't tight like that, even if they live near each other. In, in the same communities in the United States, they run in different circles, usually. Now, I say that because in Ethiopia, the men can hit the women, they're not supposed to beat them up, but they can hit the women and their culture, I mean. I don't know what the law is, but culturally speaking, they could do that. In Somali culture, it is generally, it's a taboo for the man to strike the woman. So what happens is that on occasion, in Ethiopia, because you have some Somalis that, that, had, that fled to Ethiopia to get away from the fighting, or in some parts wherein they were already the majority, and Ethiopia annexed these parts. In these areas where you've got both of them living together, there every so often what will happen is that some lady will come along and say that she hit this man because he hit her. But people will understand that this is not true because Somalis have a taboo against hitting women whether she's a stranger or whether she's a woman that's close to you. They have a taboo against it, which is why every so often an Ethiopian woman might get into an argument with them and then strike the man and then say he hit her. It's because she knows she's not going to get hit back. So when you have, uh, uh, you don't always have to strike women usually, but the minute that she knows you won't do it, Chris Rock's jokes become true. That's when you're going to get hit or the, the chances of you getting hit are going to go up. And so, um, the, uh, and and I I know that's true uh, because I've actually, that happened to me when I was younger, when I I wasn't yet an adult, but that's exactly what wound up happening even in my case. Um, Same thing to my brother. So we quickly understood 
that the man that women know won't hit them is the first man that women are going to hit right off the bat. And that doesn't seem to change from place to place. Um, it just seems to be worse in the West, but it doesn't seem to vanish when you leave the West. So even the worst, most controversial thing that Shah Razad Ali said was very limited. Uh, and it was, she said it was for the cases of hysteria, not even to cause injury. And yet and still, we generally did not take that. So this right here proves that when she says these things that sisters don't agree with, that they disagree, not because she's wrong, but actually because she's right. She seems to have understood you don't tell women that you will absolutely never hit them for any reason. You, you may not do it, but you don't tell them ahead of time and give them that kind of guarantee. She seems to have understood that, that particular point. You, you never just give them a guarantee, I'm never gonna hit you because then they'll hit you. And so um, I, guess what I'm, I guess I'm saying that to say that, that Shah Razad um, has actually never said anything that wound up being used to harm. She didn't harm black women. And she never said anything that the men turn around and use to harm black women. And even now, the worst that's happening is that brothers aren't saying I'm going to beat her and this sort of thing. All brothers are saying is I'm not getting with her. She's going to have to have all her ducks in a row and then approach me and have no kids and be attractive and look at me with lust in her eyes before I even consider her. Because that's what other women are doing when they're young and fine and childless and even when they're successful. Whereas, of course, if she has any of these, th if she has one out of these things, she's got an attitude out the wazoo. Whereas you take the, uh, the, the non -Ados, um, she may even approach me when everything's going fine in her life. Like, like if I am her preference, not that every non-black woman wants a black man, but if she's one that does, she may come to me and strike up a conversation with me and be friendly to me and, and see what I'm doing this weekend. And that's the worst that's happened in the sisters. It's not abuse. It's just being left behind. And these dudes yeah. that are abusing, they, they're the ones that ain't in the space. They don't even know about these talks and they don't know what a manosphere is. Yeah, I'm, so, I mean, like, do, do you know how many colleges graduate doctors and these Indian women and other women of other cultures are just snatching up these dudes with the thickest Coke bottle glasses that they could possibly get? The black women ain't out there checking for them dudes like that, but the cultural women are out there checking for dudes like that. They know where the actual money's at. The women want the social piece first and all that other stuff that don't matter and the stuff that do matter last. And that's where we're at because we could talk about what we want to talk about, but there's been a cultural run up of disrespect. While there's a cultural run up of absolute respect on the other side. So you got a cultural run up of disrespect, abuse body, accept um, everything. I'm going to get off the marketplace no matter what, because in order to have this black family, I'm a guaranteed part of the black family because I'm a black woman, Ados, American black woman, where this guy who's a black man, he is expendable to my black family on the other end. So the men that we're preparing to actually deal with these actual women are not equally yoked on the same thing. While well, you got most of the men lying about their actual position and point in the same environment as well. And nobody wants to admit that because if you admit that that's the case, then you look at as culturally inept as the woman should be viewed as culturally inept. Like a con culturally ineptitude is viewed on the wrong side. Like the women are actually looking at the men like the men should be looking at the women because the women have been given inordinate power over the men in the same society. But when you break through that and deal with other cultures of people, they can't compete with that because they were never taught to respect you in a way that other women have been consistently taught to respect men other places. So you have to socially retard and keep yourself under a certain type of delusion to even think that this in culture answer is going to work for you. When there's an outer culture answer that is not special, is pretty regular, depending on where you are, and that's how that works. But when you socialize your men to think that actual human-based treatment from women is a special thing, you actually mess up all the men in that culture, period. It's crazy. 
And that's, that's the thing that does have to be talked about. I've mentioned before that um, we are not at all the most dysfunctional in the world. We're not even close to it. Um, we may be the most dysfunctional in the United States and Canada. Um, even in the UK, we're not the ones that are the most dysfunctional by any- Oh strategy. no, oh no. <laughs> in the UK, it, it ain't us. Um, Everybody will tell you that no, it is it, it's it's the Daisy or the South Asians that live in ghettos that are poor that tend to be the most dysfunctional. Uh, but at least they recognize a class difference between the successful and the unsuccessful in the UK. So they'll look and say, well, no, it's the it's the ghetto dwelling South Asians um, who they just call Asians that they associate with the most dysfunction, especially sexual. Um, whereas uh, uh, well, and I mean specific to sexual crimes, they're associated with that. But that we, even in North America, we're not, uh, uh, well, in North America, we're associated with that. We're considered to be the most dysfunctional because Canada and the United States do a very, um, uh, they do a very good job of cherry picking people at the embassies and consulates that they have in other countries, especially non-white countries. That's what they really cherry pick. So a basic Italian can get a visa to visit or live in the U.S. much more easily than a highly educated but not wealthy um, Indian or Pakistani uh, or even a North African could get to go to the U.S. or Canada for that matter. Yeah, um, Dominican, Haitian, <laughs> especially mm -hmm. those two. Right. They, they really, I mean, they really got to go through the ringer to get these, these visas. Uh, or they got to get sponsored by someone that became a citizen. That's oftentimes that they, I know they call that chain migration. And that's one of the ways that that happens. But if, if you're the first in your family that's going to go and you don't have any relatives already there that have become citizens and they're thereby can legally sponsor you, you got to have bank statements that show that you're loaded. Um, they, yeah, they want you to be educated, but you might be educated and still not be loaded. They want to see bank statements that you are loaded, that you're already good to go. And it's funny because if you want a visitor's visa, they want to see a bank statement that you're loaded and that you're employed. Um, and and they, they want that to, to see that there's evidence that you will actually go the F back to your own country. That's what they say. If you come with those things already, you might as well apply for a visa to stay in the U.S. if that's what you want to do, because they'll say, oh, OK, well, since he doesn't um, since he could because he's already comfortable here in this country to which we've been stationed then we don't mind if he goes to live in the States. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Yeah, apply for that visa. We, the, the, the residency visa. Yeah, you can have one. Just fill out the application because you, you fit the criteria. It's funny like that. Now, I'm saying that to say that when you have this kind of cherry picking at the embassies and consulates like this, and then they do have orientations for people that have been approved to move to the U.S. They have orientations. And then you're told in the orientations that the Negroes are dangerous and animals and stay out of their neighborhoods. Um, then, of course, you have a situation in which Massa has uh, told them that you're dangerous. So they land at the airport and they're already afraid of you. Correct. On top of that, they've been cherry picked so that they would have resources, which decreases the chances of them being dysfunctional anyway. And they don't tell us now, neither the migrants nor uh, the ones working at the embassies and consulates are going to ever tell us that for this functional exemplary specimen from whichever nation it is, every one of them that comes over left behind about 40 dysfunctional people in the slums that, that, that you, if you want to see their dysfunction, you just got to go to their countries and walk to a slum and there you have it. Uh, uh, sexual crimes, crimes of opportunity, all of these things are there. And, and they're not really that rare uh, like what we may think, even if they're culturally unacceptable. So we think that we're the most dysfunctional. That's the first mistake that we tend to make. And the, four, the sad thing is that uh, uh, because a lot of us have come to believe this, a lot of sisters have raised kids thinking this way, and they have therefore judged the men according to standards of dysfunction, not according to standards of function. So I guess what I'm getting at is we black men are looking at each other through the eyes of the Western black woman, but she's judging us through the eyes of white supremacy. And Correct. she wants the get of stereotypes to be true. She's looking for the swaggerilla. She's looking for the itness because that's the, the, she knows that that's a nightmare. It's not just a negative stereotype. She sees it as a nightmare in the mind of the white supremacist who, who started these stereotypes. 
And therefore, she says, well, that that's what he's afraid of. And definitely that's going to be what other brothers are afraid of. So that's what I'm looking for. And and if you're not that, then you're not really a man. And so what you're dealing with, what you're saying in a nutshell is, which is why brothers step out. What you're saying in a nutshell is if you're the type of protect, protector and provider based on or, or utilizing the method of providing a safe environment, then you're not seen as protector. Provider, yes, but not protector. And if you are the protective by means of trying to make a dangerous environment safe for her, making her exempt from its dangers, then she will see you as the protector. And so what she's pretty much saying is, I don't want you to find a place for me in civilization and a peaceful environment that's safe naturally. I don't want that from you. What I want from you, Junebug, is to make me safe in a savage jungle. I want you to make the other predators afraid to come after me. That's the only protection I'm willing to accept from you. That's what we're really dealing with because we, you and I have, have you talked about this before and I've also talked about this on separate occasions. When one of us um, is trying to get with even a, a 92 octane, even a suburbanly raised system, they're, they're trying to judge us by ghetto jungle standards, swaggerilla standards. That's what they're looking for. If they come across an, uh, somebody that's not us, and I don't mean one of us that's ambiguous looking, but if they come across someone that is either from the mayonnaise mafia uh, or another group that's adjacent to them that, that, that collectively looks down on us, like the Chinese or the Koreans or the South, uh, Southeast, I'm sorry, Southern Asians, one of those groups. You, you'll notice that when they do go for a man, it's not mayonnaise. They still go for one whose people look down on us. Notice that, that that's a pattern. When it's one of these guys that, that uh, does pay attention to her, she stops demanding that he make her safe in a na dangerous environment ma by making her some exception. She quits demanding that. She then will accept his provision of a safe space for her as being adequate protection along with the provision. So if you're out with her and a conflict uh, develops and it's just an argument and you can drive away from the argument and go somewhere peaceful and you all can, can you and her can continue enjoying your time or the evening, she sees you as a coward. You're a failure because you're black. You were supposed to, to pimp slap the guy and maybe even shoot him and take penitentiary chances, not even for her safety, but just for her ego. Whereas if you are, are some for her else, entertainment as well, for her entertainment. Yeah, uh, exactly. Ego, entertainment, arousal, all of the shallow things, not because of her, her safety, then you failed. But now if you take one of these men where I live, that's, that's not one of us, because some plenty of us do live here. But if you take one of these men here that, that aren't some of us genetically, who do look at us as being ugly, and he's paying attention to her and they go out and he walks away from an argument and tells the guy uh, goodbye permanently. I'm never going to see you again. Come on, sweet thing. I know a, uh, uh, I know a spot or, or let's continue our evening. And he takes it somewhere safe and enjoys it. She's not going to look at him as being a coward because she's not holding him to that standard in the first place. This is another thing. And I'm not blaming Sharvaz for not talking about this particular point. But I think that it would be good if she did, because this is not really something that men can can even discuss with sisters. This is something that we can only discuss with each other. But the truth be told, that is actually one of the major pushes that underlines a lot of other things that sisters are doing to push brothers away. That's one of the major pushes behind the other pushes that they're utilizing and applying to us to get us to move away from them and, and, and leave them and, and wind up not competing or negatively competing and letting almost every other group of women be more attractive, at least the ones of them that actually like brothers. Um, yeah, and then, yeah. I mean, like most of their actions are, are set up to either repel the people that they actually want to see them overcompensate by trying to come back in to actually surrender to a lower standard that they know they possess. It's kind of a sick thing when you look at it versus all the other options. Like uh, an actual productive man is in season everywhere in every country across the globe. 
there is no group of men who suffers a half the male population who don't get married to the actual domestic woman within their society except for here. So if you introduce the minimum amount of choice for men, it destroys their actual ego because we're not supposed to have choice. They're supposed to have all the choice, regardless of how they look, regardless of what they bring to the table, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There is no other group in, in the United States. I'm not sure about Canada, but in the U.S., there is one other group that tends to have a similar problem. Um, but I don't hear about them. I, I, I don't know if it's true or not, but I've never heard about them um, growing into their 30s and 40s and maintaining this problem. Amongst, uh, amongst the subset of um, Mexicans, Hondurans, and Salvadorians in areas where the gangs run things, whether it's back in, in the home country or if it's in certain neighborhoods in the U.S., if the gangs tend to run things in a particular area, then the teenage girls do have that same hybristophilia. They want the gangster and they want not even just any gangster. They want the gangsters that everybody's afraid of. Correct. What I don't hear. Huh? I said correct. Because I seen a documentary on how they were actually killing women in Honduras, and it was exactly that case. What you're talking mm, about. Okay. Yeah. So she, she wanted her a thug and she got one. Um, and so... Um, they, I know that that's one other place where you can see that, but, and maybe somebody who, who lives in that environment or knows someone that does can tell me if this, if this does or doesn't happen, but I have not heard of them growing into their late twenties, let alone thirties and forties, trying to maintain this and insisting that their man be a cholo. I am not, I, I don't, I never heard that that is the case. I didn't hear that it's not. But the fact that we never even heard of anything like that, the fact you don't even see that, and the fact that you would expect any Latin American you know to make fun of a woman at age demanding this tells me something. Because we already know among sisters, you can take, and I know this from experience, you can take a, a suburbanly raised sister or a sister that grew up like me, you know, in a Huxtable type neighborhood where most of the families were like the Huxtables. That was the neighborhood in which I grew up. Um, it was becoming a black neighborhood as I lived in it. And it was becoming an upper class or let's say a middle class black neighborhood. So it wasn't even like it was becoming what we think a black neighborhood is going to become. It wasn't becoming a ghetto. It wasn't that. We had more police patrols. I'll, I'll admit we had cops rolling through a little bit more, but then they stopped after a few years because there was nothing happening. And as a matter of fact, a lot of them forget that this neighborhood even exists. And, and it's such a well-kept secret that if I gave the name of my neighborhood right now, even with my anonymity, and someone from the neighborhood found out, they would dox me as a punishment for mentioning the name of the neighborhood because we're supposed to keep it a secret. So even if you take a sister, and I'm only going off on a tangent to explain the context of what I mean by growing up Huxtable. If you take sisters that grew up like this, like the ones in my neighborhood, even they have this high Bristol standard or even high Bristol maniac standard. And it takes, them a, it takes them a long time to outgrow that. And if they do outgrow it, they're actually more likely to accept a man that's not one of us than they are to accept a man that is one of us but does not fit that standard. And so, um, and, and when they have that standard, uh, then they tend to stay, we know our sisters will stay with that standard into the 30s and 40s. And this was a problem even back in 1995 and 96. I saw that in Atlanta, so I know it's not any better now. And so hybristophilia is not something that's exclusive to sisters or even exclusive to, to the West per se. The problem is that uh, uh, sisters, even when they're not the only ones with it, they do tend to have it worse. I'm not gonna lie about that. I mean, yeah, I, I know it's, that- Because it's based off a of war economy. Like a, a war eco economy kind of breeds that type of environment. But most people have it in a no choice war economy. We have it here in a choice war economy because you don't have to pick that. In those type of environments, they don't have any choice. If the cartels decide that your 14-year-old daughter is going to the cartel because she's cute, that's the end of the goddamn story. And all the other women are going to be, even older women are going to be trying to compete for that spot. 
But within this environment, all the other women, regardless of age, get to compete for that spot within the environment all the way around, regardless of age strata. It's the same war economy. It's the same access and actual um, proximity to danger. In this actual aspect, it's a choice instance in an actual Honduras or Ecuadorian type of aspect. It is non-choice related or Colombian, some areas, is non-choice. It's still the same aspect, but is one is choice and one it is not choice, but the same social pathology is the same. Well, in the case of the, the in the case of the Eidos hybristophiliac or even the Black Canadian hybristophiliac or um, the Black British hybristophiliac, uh, it's worse than a choice, it is an insistence. What they're pretty much saying is that they're not even saying you I, I choose this and you can choose this what they're actually saying what's going on phantom clutch what they're actually saying is no we insist and and if you don't fit this warlike criteria you're not a man correct but we'll exempt you if you're not only not black we will exempt you if you're not black and your people look down on us because you notice they don't even extend this same exemption to people, to, to, to men from groups that don't typically, typically look down on us. Like, for instance, uh, Moroccans. You don't really see sisters trying to get with Moroccan men that often. Um, you, don't, you certainly don't see them trying to get with Southeast Asian men. Southeast Asians don't typically look down on us. A lot of them have a preference for us over, um, uh, over the Manage Mafia, as an example. And you do yeah. not see sisters generally being willing to get with those guys. And it's not because of height either. They may say that, but that's not what it is. Um, because if a black man is thugged out and tatted up and he's short, but he got bodies and felonies, she'll give him a shot and won't ask for a whole lot either to do it and doesn't mind taking your money or my money to take care of such a dude. So Correct. in a nutshell, um, what, what sisters are doing is they're pretty much saying, you, if you were one of our maybe not enemies, but if you were one of those that, that would never be an ally to our people, we'll make an exception for you, sir. You can just be responsible and provide for us and protect us in a civilized manner, in a preventive manner. But you, Junebug, Sean, Andre, no, you need tats, felonies, uh, you need a pistol. The pistol needs to have bodies. Uh, don't throw it away after you put a body on it so that that way, and I know, I now know, I know why that is. That way, when she gets tired, because even she's going to get tired of that man, even the one she wants, she's going to lose interest in. And if she loses interest first and she wants to get rid of that man, all she has to do is pick up a payphone and not even put in a quarter, dial 911, drop an anonymous tip, and just wait. And yeah. then yeah. when he's gone and he's in captivity, she can come visit and she can say, oh, baby, I love you and I miss you, but uh, I got to move on with my life because I'm here. I, I'm out there and you're in here and it, it, it's nothing bad about you. And baby, when you get out, I'll drop anybody for you and might even do it. I mean, if he comes out worse than he went in, she might actually make good on that. But the point I'm making is that I've mentioned this, this hybristophilia and hybristomania, and a lot of us are looking and we're saying like, why? And what you said is, well, it's based on war and that's true. You're right, it is. The issue with the Edo sister and by extension, the black Canadian and black, well, you know, the, the Western sister, I should say, yeah. is that it's more than a choice, it's an insistence. She says, no, it's got to be this. War is the only reality for you. Correct. Yeah. And then at the end of it all, it's really nothing more than just being, she's always trying to maintain a control over you simply because she cannot see you as equal to others. And that's all it is in the long run. It ain't even because she really thinks that you're a coward and a punk every time you don't slap, beat, and shoot somebody that you get into an argument with. It's not even that. She's not necessarily that stupid. It's because she just can't get her mind around the fact that that you were equal to other men. You uh, are supposed to be in control and, and the boss in a relationship or marriage with her. And therefore, she uh, uh, she needs to submit if she wants you. And she can't call the cops on you if you're not doing these things that break the rules. Because if you look at what they look, if you look at what they're looking for in one of us, it is always something that puts you in the graveyard or cell block. They never want you to do something for which you could come out after a few days in county lockup. And that, that's never enough. It's never enough. Becky, Karen and Amber, when they want that guy with the edge, that's still hybristophilia. 
but they're not necessarily always demanding that he has to go to the penitentiary and be on death row and be unavailable. Those women that write letters to the death row inmate serial killers are actually pretty rare, but they still want that edge and, and, and they're still irresponsible in their choices, but they just haven't reached that same severity that the Western sister has. But the Western sister's looking for you to either die on her so that she can be the, the single mother mourning widow or looking for you to go to prison so that she can be the single mother uh, uh, and, and still mourn the fact that you're in prison and she can still maintain a moral superiority over you because she didn't have to go to prison like you did. She's holding it down on the outside while you're in. And underneath even that, they have to have this control. That's what it, that's, they want you to do these things so that they have this control so that if nobody else catches you, she'll be the one to drop a dime because she's going to get tired of you at some point. She's going to want somebody else. And that's all it is. And let me tell you, as a person who used to be in law enforcement, most of these dudes who are locked up right now have no idea that their own woman was the one who dropped the actual dime on them. And these women gave them up for a better Section 8 department across town, gave up whole operations. For a better Section 8 department across town, crying in court on this dude's arm. This dude has no idea that he's about to be separated from his kid because of the woman who turned him in. They want digital shot collars for these dudes. They want a way to get out of the relationship as easy as they got into it. They love the trump card over people. They love the power, the ever-hanging guillotine over the head of these men. And they don't understand that you've been chosen specifically for the purpose of not sexual labor, but emotional gratification that they're actually above you through the eyes of white supremacy. And they could just call your ass. They could just pull your card at any time. They love that shit. I've seen it so many times that I, I can't. I, it, it is hard to rationalize talking to people who don't understand it because I've been through it so many times of talking to the same type of person. It doesn't matter when I own the club. It doesn't matter out there in the street arresting people. It doesn't matter. It's the same problem internally with the person who wants that type of power over a man for a very specific reason. Let me ask you this, sir, because this is something I want the gentleman to understand. And, and I'm not just trying to limit this to the shallow point of, of uh, sister selection process. But I want them to understand why it is that we can't save her. And that's why I'm covering this um, stream team means to answer your question. I don't have a cash yet yet, but the next time I go to the states and hopefully it'll be within the month. Uh, next time I go to the states, I do plan on setting one up and I'll put it in. Um, I'll put the info in here because I, I need to be in the states. Cash app doesn't work when I'm here. I need to be in the states so I can set it up um, link it to a, an account. Correct. And the other thing to stream team means is that um, the uh, not only does it not work here, but the bank in the U.S. was bought by another bank. I know the account number changed, but I can't get it. I have to wait till I'm in person and go into one of the branches, show my ID and then say, look, I've been out the country. I can prove it and then get the ID and all that. And so uh, I appreciate that. The old world remit. Thanks for letting me know. Let me check that out then and see. I appreciate that stream team means. Um, and so getting back to you, um, man, tomorrow, I. Um, uh, uh, I'm, I'm mentioning this because I have said we can't save her, and that's not what this is about. And, and some guys do tend to forget that it's not about saving her, it's about saving yourself. And that, unfortunately, even if you wanted to keep the black community genetically um, intact and distinct from other communities, that you can't do it with the Western sister, not because you hate her, but because she's just not going to allow it. She will not allow a stable family situation because that means she has to submit. And she has to submit to you after being frustrated at, at not having the life that she's seen on TV um, of Miss Ann. So I, I'm, there's a reason why I, I, I keep going back into this particular topic, which is the way she selects men and how she views us. I'm going to ask you this question, though. She, um, you, now, you said that, that oftentimes the, um, the, the, the men that are sitting behind bars don't know that the woman that cried on their arm in court is the one that dropped the dime on them. Correct. But you're aware of this. It's just the, the men usually aren't aware. 
are you do, did you find out that it was oftentimes the ladies because you were the one that could hear the, the tapes of the anonymous calls dropping dimes on them these anonymous tips were you the one that got to listen to those and then you could match the voice later on when you interviewed her or saw her in court no Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry about that. Like tip lines are not just anonymous tips. They call it tip line because anybody can direct you towards something. Like most of these people, you have them coming in and actually confessing this stuff, and then they just find some bullshit reason to pull somebody over, and the stuff is in there. So I've seen interrogations that led up to kind of arrest. To where none of that evidence actually went into actual evidence for that those type of situations. Like a lot of people think, like, damn man, how I get pulled over for no reason, man. I was just over here. Like, nah, man. Your girl knew that she was there, and if the they, they set the cops up to pull your ass over for no reason when they knew shit was in your car, right? Like the shit, it, it's not it's not a coincidence. You look like it's a coincidence, but she actually really set you up. And they actually do it in such a way to where that's how that actually works. Okay, I see. So she may be picked up with something else. And then she says, look, uh, you let me off of this or you you arrange this for me. And I'll tell that's you. That's exactly how it works. That's exactly how it works. Oh, my. Oh, my goodness. Um, okay, I'm going to ask this question to the guys in the chat. And they can answer uh, yes or no. And you can also tell me verbally. Gentlemen, in my last upload, those of you in the audience, uh, in my last upload, I believe I told because I recorded it three times. So I'm not I don't remember which version I uploaded. But um, did I tell you all a story in my last upload of a guy from my neighborhood um, that wound up uh, getting wound up being handed over to the police because a lady that he was with was picked up for what might have been a misdemeanor? Did I tell you guys that story in my last upload? If you all can remember that story. Put a yes in the chat or even a Y. If not, put a no or an N. I'll give you all time to answer. Because uh, while I'm waiting on these answers, man of tomorrow, I kid you not. This was something that I was mentioning yesterday. I just don't remember if it was if, if, if that's the version that I uploaded for my last upload. That's exactly what wound up happening. Somebody in my neighborhood. And before I repeat the story again, I'm going to give the gentleman in the chat um, time to answer. If they heard me tell the story before, Jham says no. Um, okay. Okay. Wake and black heterosexual does not remember what stream team means. Did not hear something like that. All right. Now stay grinding. I like your point that you made because I've heard about this before too. I might touch on that, but listen, stay grinding. I'm gonna ask you specifically too. Do you remember me mentioning a case where I know of? Um, a man being handed over the same way that MOT said. Okay, Quad, you said wasn't it possession? And to answer the question, it was not possession actually. Um, it was worse. It was worse than that. And so uh, I'm gonna give I'm gonna give about two more time to answer before I just repeat the story because I want to make sure that if I do repeat it, it's actually beneficial. I don't want to waste you guys' time, even though these streams are long. Um, but I also, I want you guys to remember what I'm telling you, because remember what I've asked you guys to do. Uh, well, actually, Quaj, I'm sure she did. I'm going to tell you. All right. So um, I'm telling you guys this story because one, what, MO, uh, what MOT said, I actually know of a case like this. My brother told me the story. Uh, my brother told me this, so I, I, I can remember still the, the details because it was something that was kind of uh, it was kind of relevant to me. This involves a pro-black family. This involves um, a race mixed family, as a matter of fact. And um, I tell you this because, gentlemen, I want you guys to tell the young guys that you know, the young men in your family that and I mean, I'm talking when they're in middle school, even at the end of elementary school, I want these young boys to know what we in this space know. And that's why I tell you all these things. And what MOT said, uh, I can tell you, I can corroborate this happening because the MOT is coming out of, uh, uh, I think you're coming from middle or northern Mississippi. You, I don't think, did you say that you grew up in southern Mississippi near the coast or was it another part? No, I lived there, but I was actually in uh, law enforcement in the West. 
Okay, so you in law enforcement out west, and okay, fair enough then. And I came up on the Gulf Coast. I could say that I'm pretty familiar with the coastal areas of Mississippi, um, but I don't, yeah. I'm, I don't, I don't assume that that's where you grew up though, because no. Mississippi, uh, it, it's pretty big and it extends fairly far inland. Um, so um, I'll put it like this, guys. The, uh, the nutshell, the, the, yeah, the story in a nutshell is um, there was a boy in our neighborhood whose mother was one of us and the dad was a descendant of the, our former owners and kidnappers, if you will. Now, uh, so of course he's ambiguous looking, this kid, and he had uh, the misfortune of being next to a black conscious family. And they had, the, the black conscious family had two kids, a son and a daughter, and they gave both of him Swahili names. Now that was okay. The problem was that the boy was a little bit mentally impaired, just a bit. And so uh, he had a very, uh, all puns intended, he had a very black and white way of thinking. That's how he came up. He, he couldn't understand nuance, even as an, I mean, he couldn't understand it even appropriately for his age. So of course he's right next to uh, a kid, his neighbor with no fence in between their yards and the boy's ambiguous looking. So he, you know, when he saw this kid, he would say to him certain things. And he even told me once, I don't play with this kid because uh, He's not, he's not real black, his dad's white. Now mind you, I'm ambiguous looking, but my, both of my parents are black. I'd say, well, is that the kid's fault? And he said, but he, he don't understand, no, he don't understand. So anyway, the son of the mixed couple, uh, as he got older, of course, wound up getting involved with a, a fine but ratchet ghetto stereotype chick. Let's just say she probably had watched too many Tarzan movies herself and thought that's how she was supposed to act. So she wanted things because this guy came up Huxtable in our neighborhood. She didn't. So she wanted material things. The thing is, this kid was still a kid and he was not uh, he wasn't the one that had the money. It was his parents money. So he may have had the trappings of that, but he didn't necessarily just have access to go buy gifts for her like that because we middle class families don't just hand bundles of cash to our kids so they can go buy and everything they want whenever they want it. At least not responsible parents. Apparently his parents were responsible, but she was not. So she demanded things. And so what he took to doing was breaking and entering homes to get it. Apparently he knew about security systems. So he wound up breaking into someone's home and surprising the homeowner at home. And the homeowner surprised him. So unfortunately for this boy, he won that fight. But he was the only one to walk out. Apparently he killed the homeowner. So she knew that he killed somebody to get some of these things for her. Now, he, at this point, he has to lay low. He cannot go and break into someone else's home, risk getting caught alive and identified, and then um, uh, either being caught on the spot or being caught later for a body. He can't afford that. He's got to stop doing it, right? I mean, if you're in his shoes, that'd be the time you quit. You kill someone, but you get away, you're going to stop doing it. She did not want the material gifts to stop. So she decided, well, if you ain't going to get it for me no more, then I'll go and just get it myself. So she went shoplifting. And then she got caught and picked up because, you know, a lot of our people's favorite expression is I ain't going to get caught or we ain't going to get caught. Cell blocks are full of people that said the same thing. Now, the person who says it never thinks about the cell block full of the people who said the same thing. So she got caught. And of course, she wasn't about to do any time for shoplifting. I mean, she would have had to do some time, but she wasn't willing to do time for shoplifting. So who do you think she gave up? Now, do you gentlemen understand how the rest of this goes? Of course, she gave up this boyfriend and uh, he wound up having to go to prison probably for life. And the prison to which he must have had to go, I'm pretty sure that if he did not get raped, he had to kill someone to not get raped. So now he probably has two life sentences or he's got one and he's getting raped. So that's what this kid's facing. So I want you gentlemen to understand uh, uh, why it is that I talk the way I do when I say you gotta leave her. I don't tell you beat her. Um, I don't tell you, uh, anything violent but when i say to you you got to leave her 
and you can get you a non-Western sister, she's going to be feminine, fit and cooperative and all that stuff that the sister says she's never going to be all at the same time. The Western sister, I mean. Or you, you're going to have to step out genetically. It, it's, it's going to be those choices. I say this because when you break down what the Western sister wants, even when she goes up Huxtable, it always has to result in you being buried alive on a cell block or buried dead in a graveyard. You, it, it can't, you can't live in such a way most of the time where you're going to stay alive and free and productive and she stays. That's, it, that's not really an option she's going to give you. She probably won't give that option even to one of the other men from another background because she's still going to leave and try to take him through divorce court and divorce rape him. So you don't really have this option. And when I tell you that the, the mayonnaise mafiosa is no better, that's largely because even if she doesn't demand you go to jail or the graveyard, she still is in it for the money. At some point, she's going, she's going to be in it for the money. She has to get her pound of, not even flesh, she has to get her pound of finances out of you because she knows that by getting with you, she can't go back to her own anyway. She knows that. So she's going to try to get something out of it. And you've already seen the tape wherein, um, wherein one of them tells a, a brother that when they're actually raised according to their own culture, they're not even flattered by the attention that they get from you. It's a minority of them that are. It just happens to be that, that minority is enough for our population. That's all that is. But most of them uh, don't take most of them don't look favorably upon your attention. And so this means that the ones who do are already being cast out and shunned and ostracized by their own people. So when it doesn't work with you, they know they can't go back. They understand that. So they have to live in isolation or they got to find another brother to do this to one of them, too. And they're already trained not to stay forever with the same dude. Even they are. They're just trained to be nicer about it. So when I tell you guys leave the West, that's the reason I'm saying it. And what MOT just told you guys is that a lot of these dudes are locked up based on being given up by the same woman that was crying on their arms in the courtroom. Now, in this case, this lady had to go ahead and testify against him. The thing was, uh, he was, I mean, he was, you know, quickly arrested. He wasn't given bail. So there was nothing he could do to try to intimidate her as a witness anyway. Not that he was even that kind of guy. But at the end, it, it comes down to the fact that this lady, she didn't have to sit in the court and point the finger at him. She had to give him up um, in order to get make things easier on herself. But a lot of times they have, I mean, they got ways they can give you up and you don't even know it was them. And that's Correct. what they're going to you all. So hey, here's you, another thing. Yes, sir. The guy served 27 years, had 25 to life. He killed somebody, got two extra years. This dude got out. Uh... Christmas of last year with the same woman. I remember the case very clearly. I had to tell the guy, like, did you know that your girl snitched on you? No. What? Her? i like, man, don't do anything crazy, man, but he got out and the same woman that he was with said nothing at all. It's just the one who snitched on him. He didn't even know. Went back, went to the same woman because he had no place to go. You know, you get out, you know, you have to pay all this type of shit to be in halfway houses and all this other shit. He had no idea this girl snitched on him. 47 years mm -hmm. ago. You said 20 or 40? No, 27 years this dude did. 20, okay, 27. So she appeared to be, well, if she snitched on him, she definitely was not really, really waiting for him for 27 years. No, not she at all. Not, not at all. Okay, she wasn't and, really waiting for him for seven months, I'm pretty sure. No, she got picked up on some prostitution shit. And if he would have found that shit out, he would have instantly murked her ass over it. So she turned around and just gave this dude up. Okay. <laughs> and it's, so, okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it's like, okay. no, it would have been that far of an embarrassment that, yeah, that's what happened. Turn around, gave the whole operation. That type of shit happens, man. A lot more than people want to actually think like a lot of people think that i'm like bro if these people get caught with it, why do you think they go after the women first they're trying to catch them on anything and if they would yo that that type of dude they're always doing some scam shit on the side they're not just sitting at the house man 
they're not just running a hair salon. They they got some scam shit going on. They're gonna wait till they get caught up for any reason, and then and then she's gonna give up the whole operation to save her own ass every time. So in that case, it's safe to assume that some of them only are, are getting with bros just to have someone to give up if they get caught doing what they're doing. That's what it is. It's always burn the hand, worth two in the bush. That's all. It. That's another thing. They have a trump card that they could just pull on this dude anytime they want to and maintain their lifestyle and get money out of them until the shit's over. Like, mm. a lot of people don't understand. It's that power play. It's that guillotine above the head that they could pull on you at any time. So when dudes are talking about that I, they've been sexually chosen inside the environment, like, nah, dude, you, you've you been chosen to help her maintain power, her power within the environment. That's what you were chosen for. You wasn't chosen to actually be a masculine, independent dude that's going to rule over her. You was chose to help her maintain her level of living and lifestyle in the environment. And when she didn't need your ass anymore, she could pull your car in a heartbeat and get any other of the dudes in your clique because that's how it works. Because whenever a woman leaves one of the big dudes, she just goes to another dude that's near that person in the same environment, doing the same stupid shit. And she rolls over on that dude, and she rolls over on the other dude. Like, they don't understand that the same woman is snitching on them multiple times within the environment because, you know, they have this cannibalistic sexualism shit going on to where they don't understand that the same woman is being passed around to multiple people. Uh huh. Okay, I see then. And so that's probably one of the reasons why it is that a lot of hood rats get really upset when any man, not just me, but when any man tells brothers, don't make what's what's under your belt so easy for them. Don't make it Correct. so cheap and free. Okay, Correct. and don't don't look for their validation for this. Okay, that may be why. Because really, what do they have to? What else do they have to trade in exchange, um, except for that and a place to stay when he doesn't have another place to go? Partially Correct. due to the fact that he is looking for her sexual validation, so he has to chase very shallow things that keep him distracted from deeper means. Exactly. Okay. So the, and, and look, I'm gonna say this: what I just said to make sure that I understood you correctly just now. Uh, I'm not going to sit up and assume that this is something that's going on subconsciously, and that's also based on something you said previously. You previously said that you had heard them say on different radio shows or in chats that. They know what they're doing. They know that they're picking one guy for fun now and they're picking another guy as like a retirement stability plan later on. You heard some say that they knew that's what they were doing. Correct. So this means this is not subconscious. Maybe a teen, maybe a middle schooler plans it subconsciously, maybe. But from what you said, the adults know exactly what they're doing. They're planning to go through a 304 phase with, mm -hmm. uh, uh, with, with certain guys. And apparently from what you said, even those guys aren't as select as what either of us might have thought. I mean, but just selected for a specific cause and purpose. That, that they think power is within sex. No, your power is in immediate dismissal to move on to somebody else. Like, like these women don't date within one social class and move on to another. They stay within the same social strata and class because that's what they're used to. Like, they don't go from being like, step for wise into like the, the life of crime. No, they stay within the life of crime because they know how that system works and how easily they can roll over on guys. Like the women have a hell of a lot more game when it comes to this type of shit than the men do overall. And they don't understand that women understand the criminal justice system a hell of a lot more than the men do. And it, it doesn't take a lot for a woman to give up a dude. Remember, they're mm -hmm. experts at this stuff. The experts at this stuff, they lock people up every single day. They know exactly what these women would do to sell out their actual dude. Because most of these women actually want to do something out of spite at a specific moment, and they end up getting their dude locked up for a gang of years over the shit. They don't care. They can just move on to another dude. They don't really care. Because by the time it comes to the court case, they don't want to take responsibility for it anyway. So it's like out of sight, out of mind, move on to a new man, new house, new everything. Mm. Play up 
play up the victim role, do all that kind of stuff. We're just looking in the courtroom like, good Lord. This dude has no idea that this woman got him sent up a goddamn river. And, you know, when you look at people that get out with the same woman, you want to say something, but <sighs> we're in the same game over and over again. Mm. Yeah, that's what it is. It's crazy. So in a, nut, in a nutshell, it's in a nutshell, she is intentionally, and when I say she, I mean the Western sister, the stereotype. She's intentionally more dangerous than any of us would have thought. Yeah, because it's you don't understand how easy it is for them to get away with it. I did not understand, but I do understand now because you just told us. You just explained that, that they can get away with this so easily that they would almost have to be fools to not plan. Well, I wouldn't say that, but they get away with it so easily. And what you said is they usually understand the criminal justice system better than the men. So this means they're taking time to research. Now, if they hate to read and they hate men that read, how are they getting this information if they're not either reading or sharing it with each other, uh, I guess, in the hair salons? Because that's where they can talk and, and nobody knows what they're saying. The socialization, so the socialization within the environment, dude. Okay. You don't and need to have direct involvement in, in nonsense to know the or understand the process of your homegirl who's a hairdresser or your homegirl who's a this, that, and the other. All women well, pass down this information or pass it across to other women. Men don't even pass this type of information to other men like that. We don't. It's true. But the thing is that, that they're making an effort to pass this on. And I say that because, as you said, the socialization, it's true of socialization. But see, when we talk about socialization, we have certain ideas with which they've been socialized. But we're not aware. You're the one that's dropping this gym on us right now, man, tomorrow. Um, we're not aware that they're passing on this in the form of socialization. So, and like in a nutshell, we know that they're socialized to, to nuclearly reject some guys publicly because they can get high fives for that. We see that happen because we see the nuclear rejection. We see them high fiving each other. We hear them talk. They make songs about it. They don't really hide that particular socialization that well. But when it comes to this, you take guys that have been raised by them and only them and not even by dudes. That You take men that have been raised by them. Kevin Sam was raised by a single mom. He's not aware of, of, of how much they're passing on this information to each other. He's not aware of what you just said, or he's not shown that he is. He hasn't mentioned it. I wasn't. I wasn't aware how deep this rabbit hole goes. Charles Faulkner, I think he is because he's all he also was in law enforcement. And on occasion, he mentions things like this, just not this specifically that you just now told us. But he does mention things that they would do. However, I guess what I'm saying is that. This is something that they're sharing with each other and they're making a concerted effort to make sure that the that the boys, even the boys under their knee in their house, their own sons don't know about this. Correct. Like they lie about what they want to their own sons or their nephews or grandsons and things like that. They make a concerted effort to, to hide the truth, if not outright lie, even to their, their own male relatives. This is something they're keeping from their male relatives. They're not saying to their male, their male relatives, look, we know the system. We know all these things. We share information with each other and we make sure that you all never hear it so that you don't know what to do. You don't know what we're planning. This means from what you told me, they're sharing this info with each other and they're careful to do it in ways that even their own minor sons would not hear. I mean, that's Correct. what you just told. Correct. And what you have to understand is that. Um, the most dangerous women in this environment is the person who've heard it a thousand times, but never had a chance to practice it once. The women mm. who want to be off the market because they've done so many men like this, I'm fortunate to say those are the only women that you can trust. Don't ask them about their track record because they got a lot of people locked the fuck up. However, a woman who's been around this but has no experience is the most dangerous woman on the planet. Because she's heard 17, 18, 19, 20, 25 stories of this. She's seen it from 35 different angles. Can't wait to get out there to actually do it to a dude. So this is why I said oh. when you have this so-called good woman who's around all these types of quote-unquote hood chicks, bro, that is the most dangerous woman in the group. 
is the woman who's uh, quote unquote uh, educated Keisha normal, but she's still mm-hmm. around the same type of women who got that type of experience. She's just celebrating her position and her celebrity status in a bad system. She don't want you oh. competing either. Yeah, it, it it goes a hell of a lot deeper than you could think. It, it's <laughs> so what you're saying is that you're saying the one that hasn't done it is still waiting on her turn. Correct, and she knows through non-experience, thirty-seven different ways this can cut because she got so much experience hearing it from my homegirls through <sighs> late-night phone calls and salon visits and girls parties and all this other stuff okay so in this case what you just said uh what this tells me the conclusion i draw from this and i believe what you said because you have the experience plus plus what you're saying explains so much it explains the question uh several questions that i have not yet been able to answer as a matter of fact, I've understood the, the, the dysfunction and I've theorized as to why. But what you pretty much said is that in addition to what I knew as to why, there's even more. And, and, and the layer that you you just revealed explains what I didn't understand. It explains what a lot of us have seen but did not fully yet understand. Or, or rather, it explains why it continues from generation to generation. I'll put it like that. You know, OK, you got somebody that's effed up and has a screwed up mind and makes the wrong selection. But what you're saying is that, OK, now here's the incentive that keeps on that, that keeps this thing going and going and they don't never, they'll never quit. Here's why they won't quit. OK. Um, now that you told me that my new conclusion is that we not only should not respect their preferences. Because they're unreasonable. And now what you're saying is they're outright dangerous. Actually, we don't even need to respect their privacy because they're plotting on us. If if and and plotting on someone it is an act of war, especially when you're doing it in a way that uh, it's just covert war. That's all. So what you told us, what I said previously is that they're at war with us because I got that from uh, the boogeyman from uh, Baltimore. You know what I'm saying? Talking about game and the mask, and you need to be this kind of guy. And uh, he and he was actually in combat. I think he was. He was in the military. So since he was in the military and and he knows something about war i just assume okay then then what he's he's describing the act of war so he must know that they're actually at war with us even though he didn't come out right and say it and what you're saying is that it's even deeper than this correct all right so let's okay so let me break down the magnitudes of how dangerous this is for a man the average woman Raised within Black America, starting at 13, has more experience than a guy who's 20. 13. Hear from all the homegirls, hear from ho ass aunts, all that kind of shit. So by the time she gets 18, 19 years old, she has 46 years of experience. Why you think you're gaming her out of sex? You're not gaming her out of shit. She's giving you something in exchange for something else. Like, you don't recognize how far you are outranked when it comes to far younger women today. Like, I grew up in the rural South. I routinely seen 13-year-olds stepping out of cars of 50-year-old men in the 90s. These women had kids in the same environment. We're talking about 13, 13, 13. So we're talking about 39-year-old great-grandmothers and stupid shit like that going on. Same environment. Parents are selling their kids into this. Aunts are socializing them into this. Even at a young age, you know, that best friend, daughter type stuff. You know, when a family really broke down. Like, People don't realize how internally socialized it is to get over on men, how accessorized and all this kind of stuff is. And everybody's competing for the same piece inside the same environment itself. Like people don't understand how far ahead of the curve a what they think an immature woman is 
they have no idea. And this is without even having to act on it. She got all the information from all the women who had an abortion, from all the women who had these experiences, for all, and they are just downloading this shit to the to the youth. Because if they download the stuff to the youth, then they have a position over these women and access to the same men that they're trying to to attach themselves to. Because it's an attachment level. It's no different than the actual uh, boomers who was actually sleeping with 13-year-olds. It's the same thing. How the boomers who were sleeping with 13-year-olds can tell dudes about quote-unquote female nature because they created the system for it. It's no different for the actual women who socialize the woman into understanding male nature outside of that. It's no different. It's a socialization process. There's a ton of information, ton of real world examples, but they've never been able to act on it. So when it comes time for her to shoot her shot at someone, She's acting with 30 and 40 years of experience, of guaranteed going to hit experience from all different levels. She got tons of people to talk to, pictures everywhere. Like, you don't know how far behind this you're actually sewing yourself into by setting yourself up as a sexual mark inside this actual environment itself. This is why it doesn't make any sense to me for somebody to brag to me about how they've been chosen by people. And I'm not. We're not talking about Robert F. Smiths here. We're talking about dudes who are just dumb as shit, who are just a flesh-covered dildo for some older woman within the environment itself. Because everybody's lying about the access. That That's the thing. Mm. So, and, and to make sure that I heard you correctly, you said we're not talking about those dudes that are just the dildos for the, for the elderly women. Did you? Is that what you said? Yeah, it's not them. Because the actual okay. younger women are trying to become the actual um, choice of the actual uh, dudes within the environment who do got the money. Mm-hmm. Okay, they're taught to they go work. after those people. They're, they're they're taught to go after them, and even in the rural South, the women are plenty busy, plenty early, way mm-hmm. earlier than you would ever think. Okay. Now, what I want to say next is because I'm very sure that uh, my wife and girlfriend, don't worry, guys, it's the same person, but I'm very sure she can't hear me now. So I'm going to say this to you all. The information that he gave me now uh, has given me a new appreciation for her, for the lady to whom I'm now married. And uh, I do feel quite lucky, um, quite fortunate. And... I'm not going to speculate about the nature, but I'm going to look at the decisions made. And she has not made any decision that reflects what we've been talking about right now. Now, I'm saying this, gentlemen, to tell you all this. What you've heard Man of Tomorrow and I discuss is a type of training. And uh, I don't see evidence of this training in her and in the culture, per se. I'm saying this to tell you guys this. You do have to look out for nature in general, be it male or female nature, you got to look out for nature in general, anywhere that you go. But what you have to look out for in the environment in which most of you gentlemen live, because most of my viewership is in the US, I can see that in my stats and my analytics. Some of you are tuning in from the UK. Apparently, I have nobody from Canada listening. I've got a few in the Bahamas or from the Bahamas listening. Um, But most of you were in the US. And certainly all of you were in an English speaking country except one, I believe. Um, what you have to deal with where you live, gentlemen, it's, it's altogether different. You have to deal with uh, nature, which could be good or bad, on top of a training that is completely selfish and, 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 and destructive to you, antagonistic to you. You got to deal with this, too. I'm going to tell you guys straight. What he explained to me just now tells me it answers the question as to why I've seen what I've seen, not only what other men have gone through, but even what I have to go through myself. And it also explains to me why I did not experience what I did not experience, although I could see some others who might have done so. He's explained a lot to me now and a lot to you guys. 
this continue what you did this this negativity what he's explained and the motives and, and the results of these motives continued all the way up until i left the united states and left the west in, entirely so when i tell you guys leave the west when i tell you guys we need repatriation um that that it's going to take that uh if you can do so there's a reason that i say it i've already but he just gave me he just explained to me another reason for this he explained to me actually that it is more severe than even I understood. The train to socialize to make victims of you. He, he just told us this. And in actuality, the safest route for you, if, if you're going to be with someone over there where you are, the safest route for you would probably just be to be a plaything for someone that's older. Um, and I'm not going to tell you all to do something like that because I'm not going to even tell you all to fornicate in the first place. I'm not going to say this to you, but can understand that in terms of heterosexual options, he just explained that's probably about the safest one for you, because outside of that, they are you're you're picked for just about anything other than what's below the belt. Even though they do want that, we know they've got that need. You're still being chosen for everything else, every other reason. And it has to be something that is detrimental to you. It, it's got to be something that is a loss to you and a gain for them. And when I, one thing I did say before is that if they can't make it. Um, a gain for themselves, they will still settle for making it a loss to you. That's the motive behind false accusations. When they falsely accuse you of something that's criminal and they can't get anything out of it, that's because the motive still remains that it has to be a loss to you. They, they will do that. But what he said is that it is more severe even than I understood, let alone could possibly have explained to any of you, let alone could ask you to explain to the younger men in your lives, the younger siblings. So I'm just saying this to say that what he just did was actually give you more of a reason to leave the West if what you want to do is continue a black family. If that's what you're looking to do and have a, you know, a black or any legacy at all, really, any at all, black or not, or half black, if you will, whatever, however you want to define it, you now have more of a reason that you got to leave the West. Because remember, we're talking about Boom Sheikha, Bon Quisha, and Sapphire. We're talking about the Western system. And when I told you guys that the chastity, male chastity is important, I didn't understand in terms of the life of this world. I understood religiously and practically why it's necessary. That's why I told it to you. But I didn't understand how severely necessary it is even in, in, in this life of this world before you get to the hereafter, you gotta stand in front of your maker. Um, I didn't understand that, that, that between now and your grave, your funeral, how severely necessary that is going to be for you until you get out of the West. And even after you get out of the West, you, you, you want to pick the, the chaste route, meaning you want to go the family route, um, because that generally is what works abroad. What I'm saying is that what I've been telling you all, I've been telling you for the reasons that I knew. He just sat up here and gave you all other reasons, and, and, and it's a threat. It, it's dangerous, actually. So uh, he's corroborated things I've said that, that he may not have even heard me say because he has his own channel, he's got to run, he's got time, that he's got to spend doing other things and earning a living. But what I've been saying to you all, he actually came and bolstered with even more reasons, with, with, with more knowledge that than I even understood. From Man of Tomorrow, I did already know that a lot of them, when they do make these plans, they're, they're doing it consciously, at least, yeah. by, at, least at a certain age. Yeah. It, it, by that, by a certain age, it, these are conscious plans they're making. They know that this is insulting to you. They know that they're giving the best to the worst dudes and then turn around and telling you to take them at their worst. What Alicia Watkins is doing with Boyce and her saying, I'm not going to be with him when I'm young and, and childless. OK, now that I'm divorced with other men's kids and I've already rejected him, I'll now accept his proposal. She knew for the work she was doing. She planned this from jump. And as a matter of fact, them spending time together before he proposed to her, she knew she actually planned on him proposing to her. It's always thought out. No other culture would even allow this to happen. A person who's that productive, like a person, like a person who's that productive within the environment would have somebody handpicked for him by the time he graduated college. No way that person is going on to the open market if that person is a productive individual. Like when you go, when, when you're actually raised around culture people, that's what it is. Like most of the the men who had their shit together in the city went to graduations. That's what I want. Boom, married. Not even on the market. Fine as fuck. We're talking about rural Mississippi. 
naturally grown food. Women were had bodies that you never even dreamed of in those type of environments. Instantly off the market. Don't even think about it. <laughs> mm. it, it there, there was no game involved. <laughs> what are you talking about? The person has resource supremacy. Resource supremacy ran the South. Always have ran the South. And, and, and it's like when we came up with these new standards and levels of masculinity and how people hid behind the women's choice criteria, the women only had increased choice criteria thanks to the men being subservient to the woman's level of choice criteria. Now, once men operated off a of resource per uh, supremacy and a worldwide actual concept, like most people get past the racial dynamic the moment they get access to power. They don't care about what the kids look like. They care about there is legacy, which most people hope to live to, and then there's dynasty, which people don't really care about. Dynasty is where you want to be. Dynasty is a step above legacy. No one talks about dynasty. It's easier to build a dynasty than it is a legacy. They both take the same amount of planning. But with a dynasty, it takes a hell of a lot of discipline and kicking people out the group if they don't adhere to. No one thinks about dynasty. Other families, when they come here, especially Asians, when they're here, they think about dynasty. Easy to create a dynasty through discipline than it is to create a legacy through non-discipline. This skin color is just base level. Mind state is dynasty. Skin color, legacy. Mind state, dynasty. If you care more mm. about how things operate, you don't care about how it looks. You don't care about all that other stuff. But see, some people in this environment have the only thing to offer is skin color which is why they want to add themselves to the actual basis of being the preeminence of the actual place that they want to set themselves on, according to skin color that they bring to the table, not my state. If you cared about how things work, you don't give a shit about how it looks. The United States Army murders brown people on a worldwide scale. Most of them dudes are brown skin themselves. They don't care about what it looks like. They care about how it operates. The Air Force, same thing. They don't care about what it looks like. They care about how it operates. Once you let go of the simple fact of caring about how things look and care about how things operate, you will make better decisions on a one-to-one -one basis. And stop trying to add people to the conversation who just want to be here because of the color of the skin. We have the strongest looking black family on the planet. We don't have the strongest black operating family on the planet. Don't you think that you deserve a better outcome based on my state? You do. Subtract those who want to bring for skin color and no actual attributes outside of that. It's not hard. And it's very hard to talk about this with people because it makes a lot of people upset. I, I understand that. A lot of people listen to these conversations. They think I'm mad. I'm crazy. And I'm out of my mind. I'm like, no, I got results. And these results are based on the inputs of things that actually work. And it's hard for that because men are not cultured in things actually work. And men are cultured for cooperation. Women are supposed to be cultured for cooperation, not men. And there, there's a polarity switch that you have to change within your own life yourself. So that way you can gain the upper hand on choosing people who's going to bring forth the mind state and not skin color. You can recover the skin color in what, two generations? Don't you want to be rich enough to do that? Of course you do. But you got to know what's at stake before you walk in. If you don't understand what's at stake until you actually get behind the A-ball, it's too late then. You're forced to produce. Can't leave town. A lot of people stuck in the South. 
small ass town, smart people couldn't do what they needed to do. Why? Need to produce right away. Didn't get to actually explore the levels of creativity until they were 40 something years old. Had a kid at 17 or 18 years old. You can dodge all of this. Remember, the incel is the enemy. The incel is not focused on sex, sir. The incel is misdirected and confused by the actual value on sex. That's where you need to be at. The actual monk mode that they told you that you didn't need to be on, that's the position that you actually need to be in. You can have all this stuff later. You don't need it now because no, regardless of value, it's going to have the same value whenever you engage in it. Don't you want to engage in it when your resources are up versus where your resources are down and you don't have any power? You see, people don't teach you how power works. It's a pendulum. At the first beginning of life, you don't have the power. Then when the productivity comes into play, the pendulum swings. And then you don't have to worry about the looks, the, all this other stuff. You have the resource supremacy. Resource supremacy buys you a hell of a lot more than game. Hell of a lot more than looks. Hell of a lot more than uh, position. Nobody wants to teach you that. Why? They don't want you to have a better chance in the environment that they are in. Hmm. It's not hard. Goodness, Goodness gracious. I was... Uh... I was going to lay out in the sun this afternoon for a few minutes, but I don't think I'm going to have to do that anymore. Um, you just uh, you just spit some fire. And I get what you're saying about the, the the incel. You're not actually promoting celibacy, which is a lifelong vow. What you're promoting is delayed gratification, discipline yeah. for the time yeah. being so that you don't really have to worry about an unaffordable consequence later on. And I would suggest the same thing. Now, in my faith community, we generally do promote marriage at a young age because it's when you're young that this is actually more important um, physically for both men and women. Um, and it, it, it's easier to be a chaste person when you marry at a young age. However, um, I would promote the delayed gratification if a generation was doing it so that this would not be something that has to that, that becomes binding on every generation after that. I would promote it in that case. I would say, okay, well, look, go ahead and do it this generation so that you, so that you, your family then is in a position to where your grandkids could even afford to marry when they're young. And right. instead of having to go through what we had to go through with all of the dysfunction and uh, somehow being brainwashed to think that your validation was based on how many women you conquered below the belt and their validation was how expensive they made it. And, and they, they were the only ones to ever really win that game. And only the worst of them won the game because the best men and the best women weren't really even playing. Um, Cause right now the way this game is uh, for one, as we've seen from what you said, all the ones that got game are going to be not only women, but the worst women that they're the only ones that really got game and are winning the game, so to speak. The most diabolical, the ones that are plotting the most are the ones that they, they do the most winning. And in a nutshell, by any definition, the best men and women are the ones who wind up losing. And so if the, the delayed gratification and a temporary monk mode, if you will, which is really just the same thing as saying abstinence and, and not celibacy, it's worth it if it would change this whole scenario. It's worth it then if that's the case. Um, because right now what we got is a situation in which Everybody thinks exactly what they must think in order for the absolute worst women to win and, and win at the expense of good and bad men alike or even just normal men and somewhere in between. Everybody has the exact mindset that it takes for this to be the case right now. The man thinks, well, my, even if he's generally a good, good dude, he still thinks his manhood is, is um, validated by the women. Something that something to which the women must consent is going to define his manhood. They're not going to consent to something if they're against you. That's going to validate your manhood because they're already against you. But they will consent to something that you think validates your manhood if they're against you. So long as that winds up actually working against you and working for them later on. So you think about it. I mean, this mindset 
we have is exactly good for anybody that hates us, whether it's from the inside or from the outside. Whoever hates us must be rejoicing in the mindset that we have. And so I'm going to uh, I'm going to re-promote again what I've been saying to do that, that, that men need to go ahead and understand the value of chastity and, and, and um, understand from a young age that it, it's actually normal for you to feel somewhat shy around women you don't know and not want to pull your junk down and expose your junk to a, a stranger or even somebody you know insufficiently. That shyness is actually good, that you are capable of being even more chaste than what the average lady is telling you that they're capable of doing easily with no effort just because they want you to believe that you've got to go through these walls and barriers uh, to, to get them to validate your manhood. And, and that mindset only serves to where they can do exactly what it is that man of tomorrow just told us they're going to be doing for the reason that I previously knew and for the reason that he explained it's another layer underneath the reason that I previously knew and talked about. Um, so I really appreciate you coming on, MOT. It was a, a real, really, it was a stroke of good luck um, because uh, hopefully I suspect that this is actually going to inspire some of the live streams. I suspect so. Um, because what, what you exposed to us, having come through law enforcement, um, is, is this is going to be a game changer right there. People are going to be talking about this as long as enough people hit the share button. And right now we got 66 people viewing. So if each one of you hits the share button and we got 73 likes, thank goodness. I don't know how many of you hit the share button, but I'm going to say this, gentlemen, if each of you hits the share button and says to them, you've got to hit the share button then this is going to spread and this is going to this needs to be a topic of many other live streams and uploads this is something that needs to get out what man of tomorrow just pull the covers off of needs to, to get out and in in person gentlemen it's summertime you know how we do in the summer that's when we have family reunions and family cookouts this is going to be the time when we can tell some of them the young fellas um in person face to face our nephews our sons our younger brothers that are minors that are about to go into middle school, they need to hear that these are the games that are being played and plotted against them. They need to know this stuff. And, and I, what I would love to see is that by the end of this summer, by the time the weather cools off in the US and the fall starts and leaves start falling, that, that the, the, the cats, the, the boys we got that are going into middle school, don't just not prefer, I'm not looking for them to not prefer their own race per se, it's not about race really. But I would like for them to understand that this is what's being plotted on against them and that it is perfectly OK and even preferable for them to be the ones that are chased and don't make them draws too easy. Because when they're told that they're 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 when they're told that their manhood rests in them breaking women's chastity and getting women to break the chastity to validate them, then you already have something that's mutually exclusive. The men and the women already are in a, a, a type of sexual conflict. And in the end, it is only the ladies that benefit. And it's not even the, it's the worst women who benefit from this because it raises the value of what they're withholding in the first place, not for any more reasons, but they're withholding it specifically to get what they don't, what they're not entitled to in exchange for it. As what MOT said, getting what they want from you while they can. Sometimes that's validation, mostly getting the material things from you when they want what's below the belt, getting that too. And then when they find someone else that they want, they don't even have to tell you I'm leaving you. They just or when they when they when they do get picked up for something they're doing that's illegal and wrong, whatever the case is, they simply just they they tell someone with a badge something about you and get whatever the hell else it is that they want. And understand what, what MOT just told you is that they will snitch you out or this, they're looking for guys really that they could snitch out. You might think, well, suppose I'm just going to be a straight laced character. Well, then they don't want you. But if you're a straight character that's not doing these things and they choose you, that means they're going to set you up so that so that the police don't know that you're not doing these things when they pull you over. In other words, they're going to plant it on you if that's what they got to do, because he done told you what the motive is. He, he explained what the motives are, another layer behind the motives. And if that's their motive, you already know that they're not, that if, if they're above telling them what you actually have done or what some other man's actually done, they're not above framing and setting someone up who didn't do it. That's the other thing you got to understand. They're not above that. 
why not? So you take that guy I told y'all about in my neighborhood that grew up. He was younger than me. I didn't meet the guy, but my brother knew him and he told me about him. You take this guy. Let's say that uh, let's say that he didn't commit a murder, just breaking and entering. But the news said that somebody was found dead at one of the homes that her boyfriend broke into and, and, and stole from. Let's say that, that, that he had nothing to do with the murder, just the burglary. Do you think, even if she knew that he had nothing to do with the murder, do you think that she would tell that to the officers when she got picked up for shoplifting? If she could blame him for a murder that he did not commit, she would have still done it. Because after all, I mean, you give up a burglar, that might not get you off completely for shoplifting, but you give up a murderer, that'll get you off. So if he didn't commit the murder, she still would have said that he did. Because that's the motive. We see what the motive is. So why not do that if, if that's what she's got to do? So understand, gentlemen, you got these dudes, when, when you do dirt, trying to get with them, then they're going to set you up for it. I mean, you're going to take the fall, of course, and she's going to be the one, from what, he, from what MOT just told us, she's going to be the one that's going to drop that dime, and you're going, uh, you're going to take the fall for it. What if you didn't do it? But you still got the same motive. So gentlemen, that's why that's the practical earthly reason that I've been promoting chastity on top of the other reasons I've told you all about after the grade. So um, that being said, uh, MOT, it's time for uh, it's prayer time over here. So I'm going to wrap it up. But do you have any last words for, uh, for the listeners or even for their younger relatives that aren't listening now, but that they might see later on during the summer before I head out? Your average 16-year-old woman has more experience than your average 48-year-old woman on the planet when it comes to sex and relationships and emotional intelligence. Okay. Now, you, you compare the 16-year-old to the 48-year-old. Yes. Okay. Did you mean to say the same gender at the time you said it? Same gender. She's oh, a woman okay. raised in this environment. She has a hell of a lot more experience than the dudes. So if you think you're actually getting something oh, okay. out of her, I'm, that's not how that I'm sorry, works. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but when you, you were saying 16-year-old, you're saying that she, a 16-year-old, has more experience than her grandmom at 48 or that she has yes. more experience than him at 48? No, she has more experience than her grandmother at 48. Oh, okay, gotcha. Okay, so you're saying it's getting worse each generation. Yeah. Like, think about this Ultron 4 and Ultron 5. Like, they're creating them that systemically every year to update to the act. Like, most of the women listen to the game channels more than the men do. Because the women have a hell of a lot more to get out of the actual men that, that those other dudes are setting up as suckers. Okay. Yeah. So, oh. yeah, they know that aspect of it, too. They know the suckers who want to come in and brag. They want to know what the fresh young people who's trying the most up-to-date stuff are thinking. So that's just where we are. It's, it's like it, it's, it's a cycle, and it's men who are feeding other men into this system. And it's women who are feeding other women into the benefit cycle of the system itself. So the men who are actually way older are actually not helping men at all. They're helping the women with the actual people who they actually uh, deal with these things with. So. Okay. All right. So we, we need to understand. So what you're saying is that it's not just a perception. It actually is getting worse. Now, now BGS has talked about how bad it has been, but, but you're, you're saying you're sure now that it's, it's getting worse. Far worse. Far worse because mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's we have now two generations of now, I mean, you know, a normal generation used to take 25 years. Now it's 15 to 17 within the black community itself. So, mm, okay. That have a kid that. at uh, 17 or less, it's a probably, I think, 80% chance you're going to have another kid within the same strata. So it's, it's, it's that. Gotcha. Okay. All right. So then that's what we need. That's what the men need to understand there that at 16 she knows more than either her grandmother let alone than um her granddad or her brother or her her father in between um, correct okay gotcha all right then so mot uh let me end by thanking you immensely for coming on i really appreciate that you're the only one that was uh, brave enough to come on uh to, to click the link and come on 
and you wound up really dropping a gem that's worthy of, of, of not only being replayed by others and being shared, but also is worthy of being covered in other streams. This is something that's, that's going to be necessary. So I'm going to tell you all in the audience, um, you all also should thank him for coming on and, and explaining what he explained from a law enforcement standpoint and make sure that you spread this word, this information, um, because this you are involved in a war. You didn't pick it, but you're involved in a war. And when you're the good guy, the only fair fight is the one that you win. So fight to win, gentlemen. Thanks again, Mr. MOT. I really appreciate that. All right, cool, man. Uh, thanks for having me on, man. You have a nice day. All right, gladly. So anytime. All right. So, gentlemen, uh, I appreciate that. I really do. Your patience. Uh, we went three hours and 10 minutes, 11 minutes. I really do appreciate that from you. Um, hit share button. Tell somebody else. Thank you for listening. Black heart, black mind, blackout. Assalamu alaikum. You all know the rest.